Looks like we're ready to go, Jennifer. I see we got a green light. I think it's seven o'clock. Six fifty-nine still. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the December 21st, 2021 meeting of the Edina City Council, the last meeting of the Edina City Council for calendar year 2021. Thanks for being with us this evening, whether you're here with us in chambers or tuning in from home. Uh, we're continuing to do these uh, meetings in a hybrid fashion. And uh, so that means that we're, we're broadcasting virtually. People are going to be able to call in. We've got one public hearing matter this evening and we've got community comment uh, available for people as well. So before we call the meeting to order, I wanna make sure people uh, that are watching on cable TV or at edinamn.gov live meetings or facebook.com slash edinamn uh, know that they can call in and we'll put the number up on the screen here. 800-374-0221, and then the conference ID number you can see on the screen, 4645228, 4645228. You wanna press, uh, press star one, and then uh, talk to the operator, we'll get you in the queue, give the operator your name and your address and your phone number, and then as you can see on the screen, press star one, and then you'll get into the queue with Director Benarat, and then she'll bring you in to speak to the council. So as I mentioned, there's a couple opportunities for public participation tonight. One is on public uh, comment or community comment, and we'll get to that shortly. And in that portion of the agenda, you can speak to the council about anything that's not on the agenda this evening or scheduled for a future public hearing. So other than those two qualifiers, you're welcome to speak to the council on matters of concern to you. And then uh, just a reminder, as Director Benarat told you, you'll have three minutes. Uh, you'll get a yellow light when you've got 30 seconds to go and then please wrap up your comments within that three minute window so we make sure we treat everybody the same. And then as I mentioned, we've got one public hearing matter uh, this evening and uh, we'll uh, rebroadcast the uh, number to call in when we get to that public hearing matter. So uh, having provided that information, uh, would you, I'm calling the meeting to order and I'm asking our clerk Sharon Allison to call the roll. Councilmember Anderson? Here. Councilmember Jackson? Here. Councilmember Pierce? Here. Councilmember Staunton? Here. Mayor Hudlin? Here. Next matter before us this evening is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a form of meeting agenda in front of the council this evening. It's been published uh, earlier in compliance with the, the law to the residents of our community. Is there anyone that wishes to modify the meeting agenda? Staff or council, is there a motion to approve the meeting agenda as shown? So moved. Second. Member Jackson moves. Member Pierce seconds the approval of the meeting agenda as published. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adopting the meeting agenda as published, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Before we move on to a community comment, uh, we had a death of an employee for the city of Edina over the weekend, uh, a gentleman named Don Bierbaum. And um, our city manager, Scott Neal, wants to um, do a tribute to, to Don. He was just a wonderful, wonderful guy. Manager Neal. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, we do want to note the passing of Don Bierbaum. Don started working here in December of 2001. He was a uh, maintenance uh, technician at Centennial Lakes Park. Uh, he worked there for more than 20 years. He was uh, a guy that cared deeply about the condition of the park and was proud of that park. Uh, he knew all the regulars, you know, park. There's a community that surrounds uh, Centennial Lakes Park. It's, it's, it's um, all season long. He knows folks. He knows how they like the plants and, and how they like everything there. So we're going to miss him. And uh, we just want to make a, a note about uh, caring for his family and, uh, and his coworkers in this, in this loss. 
Yeah, thanks, Manager Neal. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, just a wonderful guy. Always had a smile on his face. Knew so many people that were at the park on a regular basis to use the park facility. I know many of my neighbors, uh, he was on a first name basis with them. And if some of them were gone for a few months in the winter, he was just uh, excited to see them uh, come back again in the spring. So he's gonna be greatly missed and we're just gonna have a moment of silence for Don Bierbaum and his family. Thank you. Thanks everybody. And now we're gonna move on to community comment. Uh, I'm gonna put that number up on the screen again for people that might be listening in and watching as well. 800-374-0221, conference ID 4645228. And uh, you're welcome to get in the queue and stand by. We're gonna ask folks that are in the council chambers and there are several here tonight, and of course we have, as I mentioned, one public hearing matter, but there may be folks here that want to visit with the council about matters of concern to them that aren't on the agenda or scheduled for a future public hearing. So um, we're now going to take community comment from the audience with any issues that are of concern to them. Folks, if you want to come forward during community comment, please feel free to do so. Uh, Andy Brown, 5512 Park Place in Edina. A um, couple quick questions. Um, first, thank you again for the effort on the uh, fire station number two at Southdale. Was just wondering if we could get a quick update on where the third fire station stood for North and Northeast Edina. Uh, the second thing would be uh, last Saturday night, uh, early Sunday morning around three o'clock, there was five gunshots over in East Edina. Woke me right out of bed. Um, I used to live next to the uh, her Majesty's Royal Marine uh, shooting range in uh, Kent, England, a long time ago. So I know what a gunshot sounds like. And uh, so I'm wondering if the city is gonna look at investing in um, the same technology that the city of Minneapolis has for gunshot uh, technology to trace where that sound is coming from so that uh, we can uh, do maybe a better job or a better understanding of what's, what's happening out there. So just those two things, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Braun. Thanks for coming in this evening and have a nice holiday. Thank you. We can arrange, if you have something you want to put on the center screen, we can do that and we'll give you a handheld microphone. Thank you. And, and I think, yeah, you've got it uh, well centered there. Got it, okay. Uh, my name is Julie Risser. I live at 6112 Ashcroft Avenue. This is what I see, it's in my neighborhood. And it's something that um, has been going on. This has been being used as a construction staging area. And what we're talking about is a parcel of land that is zoned PCD1, okay? It's the old Burley's site. And um, back a couple weeks ago, Janie Weston spoke to the council that was November 16th, she outlined a his, the history of this and it's been going on now, not just for months, but for years. And um, I came before the council July 21st to raise issues of concern about this back when it was a dirt pile. Um, the response I got was that in two to three weeks, the dirt would be removed, it would be graded, and it would just look like an even plot of land. That didn't happen. It was a lot longer than that. And then it started being used to store lots and lots of material. And I really encourage you to go back and listen to um, Weston's comments from the November 16th meeting. And then I really encourage you to listen to the response that she received, which didn't address this site and how it's being used. Now, if you look at our ordinances and you look at what principal uses are allowed in the PCD1 district, there's a lot of things you can do, okay? But you can't use it as a construction staging site. And if you look at um, accessory uses, you can't use it as an accessory use as a construction staging site. And right now, 
It's being used to service a site across Valley View Road, which is a very busy road. And what this means is that there have been days um, where Valley View Road has essentially been functioning as part of the construction site. Okay, this is not an allowable use. It's been going on for years. And it keeps coming back before you because we're not getting answers about the safety and about why this is happening. And if it can happen here, and can I do it in my yard if I want to make some extra money? There's lots of construction going on. Can I be a construction staging area? I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's right. And I particularly am concerned about the neighbor who's right next to this. It's not fair. Please make it stop and please make 2022 the year that this site stops functioning in this way. And I want to leave you with this piece of paper here because I'm going to be listening to the response from tonight. This is the question I want answered. Why is 4404 Valley View Road functioning as a construction staging area? Okay, why is that happening? And if everything is removed and it no longer functions that way in 2022, I don't want to hear that it's no longer functioning that way. That would be good but I want to hear why it was allowed for years to be used this way. All right, Ms. Risser, would you, anything you want to give to the clerk, would you hand it to the clerk and then we'll make it part of the record and yes, thank that'll you. facilitate answering this question a couple that you posited a couple of weeks from now. At our next meeting, thank you. Anyone else? In the chambers, okay. All right, um, how about online? Director Benerot, anybody online that wishes to address the council on a matter of concern to them? Yes, it's not sir. on the agenda tonight. Our first caller tonight is Mr. David Frankel. Operator, will you please unmute the line of Mr. Frankel? And Mr. Frankel, please begin by stating your full name and address for the record. Lakeview Drive. Quick comment about the uh, previous comment. Uh, I've complained several times to Dyna 311. Mr. The, Frankel, uh, Mr. Auxiliary Frankel, construction. Mr. Frankel, would, yep. you, would you give us your address too, please? Yeah, I did. 4510 Lakeview Drive. Thank you. Yeah, the previous comment about that construction site on Valley View, I've complained several times to the Dyna 311 site that the construction site is making a mess in the street as well as the sidewalk there. And we all know at the public sidewalk and under city ordinance, they're not allowed to just dump anything they want and not clean it up. But also the dirt piles that were mentioned there uh, never had silt barriers around them, which are required by state law. And I, I don't know why we have to complain about the city enforcing the various ordinances and laws on these construction sites. But the main reason I called today is to find out why the city of Edina is not requiring city employees to be vaccinated for COVID. If you follow today's news, President Biden came on TV and asked people to get vaccinated for COVID due to the newest uh, variant that's spreading across the country. And you may have also heard Governor Walz, who's fully vaccinated, now has COVID. There's a number of government agencies across the United States that are requiring vaccination, including the federal government, state of Minnesota, Ramsey, Hennepin County, St. Paul, Minneapolis Schools, city of St. Paul and Minneapolis, University of Minnesota, and a lot of large corporations like Medtronic and 3M. Why is the city of Edina refusing to make sure its employees are vaccinated or at least are tested on a weekly basis? I don't understand why they're doing that. We're seeing a whole new wave of Omicron virus that is spreading across the United States. And it's maybe a possible solution to refusing to require employees to get vaccinated. Take the $30,000 consulting fee you're gonna use for a liquor store, which is great timing in the middle of a pandemic, and pay employees $100 a piece enough for 300 employees to get vaccinated. Pay employees to get vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frankel. Anyone else, Director Benerant? Okay, good. Uh, well, not good, but I mean, it's, it's over. You know, if they're not calling in, then, then we'll move on. Well, we're happy to hear from anybody uh, that, that want to call in. So 
Uh, that number again was 800-374-0221, uh, conference ID 4645228. And um, we'll wait just a minute to see if anybody else calls in. And then these concerns that were raised tonight by Ms. Risser and Mr. Frankel and Mr. Brown will be addressed at our next council meeting by our city manager. And uh, as is our practice, the city manager will now respond to the community comments that were made at our last city council meeting. Sure. Manager Neal. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, we had uh, one participant in uh, community comment at our December 7th council meeting. It was Mr. Frankel. He called in to uh, share his observations that the pedestrian bridges over uh, Highway 100 uh, between here and uh, the Crosstown are not uh, ADA compliant, and he's right about that. Uh, those are uh, owned and operated by MnDOT. We would agree that uh, when they are replaced, uh, they should become and will have to become ADA compliant. And the same is true with with our bridge, uh, pedestrian bridge that crosses the Crosstown as well. Uh, there are two new bridges uh, that have been built in the last few years um, to accommodate the uh, Nine Mile Creek uh, Regional Trail. And both of those bridges, uh, of course, one over the Crosstown and one over Highway 100 are ADA compliant. And so we would expect to see new bridges when MnDOT replaces the existing ones um, that would fit that requirement. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, let's move on to the uh, consent agenda. Uh, we have a couple of council members that wanted to remove some items from the consent agenda. Member Jackson wanted to remove item 6D and Member Anderson wanted to remove item 6F. Does any other council member wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? Not hearing anything, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of items 6D and 6F? So moved. Second. I had a motion by Member Jackson, second by Member Anderson to approve the items on the consent agenda in a single motion with the exception of items 6D and 6F, which we'll take up momentarily. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion as stated say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. All right, we will go to 6D, which is um, a resolution that would uh, potentially set park and rec fees for calendar year 2022. I'm going to go to Member Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Director Vetter, I have a couple questions, or one question in particular, about our um, participation fees. So a, a resident has asked me a couple of times um, whether our, to participate in sports like soccer or flag football, any dining, is, how that compares to our neighbors and how we set those rates. And I wondered if you could um, explain to us how that is done, please. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mayor, members of the council, Councilmember Jackson. Um, when we set our parks and recreation fees, we look at a few things. We look at um, the ability to provide access to our residents and participants, the affordability, and also kind of the equity as well. Um, each sector or division of our responsibilities has its own cost recovery metrics. And a lot of that is driven by staffing. Um, specifically your question about athletic associations. There are 14 uh, recognized athletic associations in Edina. Some of those examples are the Edina Baseball Association, basketball, hockey, et cetera. They set their own fees. Um, when it comes to what some of their cost drivers are, they probably have the same examples of their, their access to facilities. And that's where the city of Edina comes in. Uh, when it comes to uh, participation fees that we charge each association, uh, those fees have not increased during the last three years, and that's $13 per participant per season. We also charge an additional dollar, and that dollar goes towards inclusion services. So if any association uh, needed, for example, an inclusion specialist, a sign language interpreter, we would provide that at no cost then to the team and the coach and the participant. Um, a lot of our other fees that associations have that are, say, inside a facility, such as um, ice time rental or our sports dome, those are capped at an annual increase of no more than 3%. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll move to item 6D, please. All right, thank you. Is there a second to Member Jackson's motion to adopt 6D? Second. Member 
Pierce seconds uh, Member Jackson's motion to adopt resolution 2021-121, <coughs> which would set the park and recreation fees for 2022. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion of stated say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And then on to Member Anderson and 6F, which is a request for purchase uh, for an outside consulting uh, service on do, uh, doing a Edina liquor store study. Member Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, um, I requested the removal from the consent agenda on this item um, due to a couple of, of, of questions I had myself. I, I wasn't aware of a potential expansion of liquor operations. More importantly, there were questions from residents that came up in the course of uh, the last 24, 36 hours. Um, and I, I, I understand those questions. Uh, it, 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 there's an up and down nature to the liquor business. We've experienced that here. And so what I wanted to ask, and I'm not certain if uh, Mr. Furbish is present tonight. No, I'll but take these. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so I, I, it's, I'm, I guess I'm inquiring about the current profitability and its uses, where the funds are distributed, and what community benefit it has. Sure. Um, members of council, um, there's a couple of ways to, to answer that question. First of all, I think the uh, taking a look at the market area for our liquor operations is important uh, to not only is to assess whether we have the right number of stores, but do we have the right kinds of stores? Uh, do we have the right sizes of stores? Are we in the right places? And so taking a look at that every five or 10 years, it's 10 years in this case, I think is, uh, is important to do for uh, an operating business like this. Uh, one of the ways that we assess uh, this, this uh, aspect of our operations is uh, in terms of its support from the community is we ask a question uh, every two years in our quality of life survey. And the question is, goes like this. Uh, the city of Edina owns and operates three municipal liquor stores. The profits from the Edina liquor are used to offset operating costs and for capital expenses at recreational facilities. To what extent do you support the city continuing to operate its municipal liquor stores? From 2015 to current, that's been 86%, 88%, 88%, 88%. So a high level of support from the community to continue to be in that, um, in that service area, particularly because of the way that the revenues are used in the community. Over the last um, five years, from 2017 to current, uh, we have transferred out from our liquor profits uh, almost $4 million, so $3.8 million, and 2.6 of that has gone directly to uh, assisting us in buying down the cost of operations at, at the Ice Arena, the Art Center, Centennial Lakes, and Braemar Golf. So that's what we do with the profits from this part of our operation. We pay for the operation itself, and we use it to buy down the cost of those operations for, so, that they're, so that we can continue to provide a low-cost, uh, and high service environment for our recreation facilities. Thank you, that's very useful. Um, I, there's nothing wrong with the study. I, mm -hmm. I, I think they're, they're very, very useful. And I, I would though <laughs> mention that this appears to be an expensive study. And I think that's one of the comments that was made. It's over $30,000. Um, and so I, I guess I'm, I, the specifics of the study, the, of that search, um, and so I'm, I'm assuming that it's not simply an area market study that might look at certain components of the liquor business, but that also we'd be looking at feasibility of a fourth location where I think that this is headed or the consideration for that is headed. Um, and then what's the return on investment mm -hmm. if that were to be made? It's my understanding that we've generated about, is it about a million dollars a year? Yep. Okay, is that net net? Yep, that's net, that is net, that's the profits after all operating costs. And that goes to uh, primarily parks, I think, they're the recipient uh, of that. Mostly, is... yeah, mostly our recreation uh, facilities, parks and rec facilities. Okay, yeah. all right. So, okay, and so I think, I think I understand that and that's very useful, the explanation's useful and I think it will be edifying for many. Um, so what I would like to see here, though, is uh, to an expansion of the study itself, to just to take a look uh, at um, the reasoning behind considering expansion. 
the feasibility of it, return on investment. As long as we're doing it, I think we should look at the whole thing so that everybody really fully understands it. I'm not certain that that matter would come here again. I don't know. Ultimately, it would. Ultimately. Okay. So that information then would be, would be very useful. I would note the last time we took a look at this, uh, there was not justification for a fourth store. So we only have, so we still have three. Okay. Very good. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. Yeah. So, uh, Your Honor, on that basis, I would, uh, I would move to approve item 7F, which is the uh, liquor store study. 6F. 6F, you meant. Excuse me, 6F, thank you. Yep, thank you. Second. Yes. All right, we've got a motion and a second to approve the request for purchase for a store location study for Edina Liquor with uh, an organization called Dakota Worldwide Corporation for $30,500. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of the motion have stated to say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thank you for asking those questions, Member Anderson. It was good to get that information out there about the, the reasons why we're in the municipal liquor business, at least one of the reasons. Um, all right, I, before we leave the uh, consent agenda, I just wanted to note that um, one, of the, one of the resolutions passed was 2021-125 uh, when we have donations to the city of Edina, it requires a super majority of the council to approve those proposed donations. And we did approve those tonight. And I just want to make sure that we give recognition to those uh, folks and those organizations that made contributions uh, within the last couple of weeks. The Friends of the Edina Library, and I'm sure many of you been, have been to that October book sale at the Senior Center. I know I've been over there bringing boxes of books home. Um, they donated $1,000 to our Park and Rec Department, and all of these are donations that I'm going to read here to Park and Rec. Uh, the Grandview Square condo residents uh, donated $900 to put a crab apple tree at Sherwood Park, and that was uh, the Anna Yoko House, Bruce and Mary Bean, David and Janet Zenz, Bill and Sally Hauger, Grace Dow, Dick Young, Dale Thorns Joe, and Mary Cole all uh, donated to the purchase of that tree. Thank you very much. And then Andy Warzak uh, donated $2,800 to the Park and Rec Department for two ironwoods, one oak and maple trees at Chowan Park. And EHR Construction donated $700 for a tree at Pamela Park. And then finally, the Fire Department also got a donation for general fire department usage in the amount of $500 from J. Patrick and Linda M. Smith. Thanks to all those donors and donor organizations for supporting the city of Edina. All right, now we'll move on to the next portion of the agenda, which is um, special recognitions and presentations portion of the agenda. We don't have any special recognitions this evening, but we do have a presentation from our transportation planner, Andrew Scipioni. And uh, Mr. Scipioni, welcome. We're going to have a, uh, it's a, not an action item, but it's an informational item only. And we're going to discuss the work of the Transportation Commission and then your own staff recommendation with regard to what we call organized trash collection. And that'll be identified, I think, in the process of your report. What do we mean, what do we mean by organized trash collection? So uh, welcome and go ahead. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. Um, joining me tonight, <clears throat> excuse me, in person, we have uh, Commissioner uh, Lori Richmond. Uh, virtually as well, we have Commissioners Kirk Johnson and Jill Plum Smith. So as part of their 2021 work plan, the Transportation Commission investigated the impacts of organized trash collection. Organized trash collection being uh, a system in which uh, one hauler or a consortium of haulers um, is designated geographic areas within the city to collect solid waste. Um, the commission investigated the impacts specifically related to um, traffic, the environment, and reducing wear and tear on our city streets. To complete this initiative, the commission reviewed existing city goals and objectives, analyzed the quality of life survey results, met with staff from the cities of Richfield and Bloomington, and reviewed relevant literature on the subject. 
As stated in their final report, the commission believes that there is sufficient evidence to support moving forward with establishing organized trash collection in Edina and recommends that the city council direct staff to create a plan to establish organized trash collection. That involves includes determining staffing and administrative costs, a timeline and a communi communication plan to educate the community and solicit public input. The Energy and Environment Commission also reviewed a draft version of this report <clears throat> and voted in support of it. Excuse me. <clears throat> Their comments are included in Appendix C of the Commission's report. Although the ETC notes that organized trash collection aligns with various goals in the Comprehensive Plan and the Living Streets Plan, it is not specifically mentioned as an initiative the city should, should pursue. Staff does recognize that organized trash collection relates to several strategic objectives. In regards to travel demand management, while organized trash collection can reduce the number of garbage trucks on the roadways, regular passenger vehicles account for much more of the traffic uh, and would be more effective to take actions to reduce those types of vehicles. The recently adopted Climate Action Plan does briefly mention organized trash collection, but in the context of decreasing per capita solid waste, not reducing emissions. As the ETC notes, Hennepin County requires organized haulers to deliver solid waste to the Hennepin Energy Resource Center rather than a landfill. This would allow the city to better track tonnage and emissions and thus progress towards reducing solid waste. The opposition of smaller locally owned hauling businesses suggests that organized trash collection may not support the city's economic development objectives. And finally, the city of Richfield's experience indicates that organized trash collection may support equity through price transparency, but the extent of possible price disparities within Edina is not known at this time. The Commission's report also mentions question 31 from the Quality of Life Survey, which asks, to what extent do you support the city changing from the current system in which residents may choose from several different haulers to a system where the city chooses one hauler for the whole community? In the most recent survey, 2021, 53% of respondents expressed some level of support, excluding the don't know responses. However, the don't know responses represent 23% of total respondents. With this group taken into account, the actual number of respondents in support is 41%. At this time, staff does not support the commission's recommendation. Without clear direction from city council or consensus from the public, staff feels that the city's efforts are better spent on actions that are recommended in the comprehensive and climate action plans related to traffic congestion, sustainability, economic development, and equity. However, if the council wishes to move forward with this initiative, it could consider directing the city manager to study possible revision of question 31, directing the city manager to review staffing levels and administrative costs required for organized trash collection, or hosting a community forum on organized trash collection. Staff would like to thank the members of the Transportation Commission and the Energy and Environment Commission for their work on this initiative, and we'd be happy to take any questions you may have at this time. All right, Mr. Scipioni, thanks for that succinct presentation on a really comprehensive piece of work that was done by both you and uh, all of the members of the uh, Edina Transportation Commission. Uh, questions from council members at this point in time? Comments? Member Jackson? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so some of these questions might come out in the course of the, the staff doing a, um, a feasibility study. Um, in one of your three answers, but I'm just gonna ask them anyways because this is um, some of the things that I thought about reading your report. Um, the first thing is something that came up um, and that is what kind of recourse would residents have if their service is unsatisfactory? So these are really questions that uh, would be necessary to do, to do this. Um, right now you can leave your hauler and get another hauler. So in in exchange or in lieu of market forces, what kind of recourse would uh, residents have for unsatisfactory service? Um, I guess one of the things you're recommending if we do move forward is to figure out the staff time and cost required to do that. That's something I'm very much interested in learning. Um, I know that this can be a complicated process, but so I'd like to know how much it would cost for us to, um, to go down this road. Um, one thing that happened in St. Paul, that I don't think it happens here, but I'd be curious to know, and that is in St. Paul when they went to organized hauling, there were a number of people who were sharing um, garbage services. And I don't know if that happens in Edina, maybe some elderly residents share with a neighbor. Um, and that was a big point of contention that then they would have to have individual um, 
a pickup where before there was a sort of a neighborhood thing. And I wonder if that's something that's happening in Edina. That's a, a fact question for you. Um, and let's see. Uh, obviously, one thing that we'd want to know and then publicize is uh, whether there'd be any cost savings for individual households in doing this process. That was one of the things that the report showed um, that was, I was really surprised by and, and pleased to see, but I'd like to see some, um, some more data on that um, as, of course, in any moving forward. Um, and then uh, I'd like to know what kind of market share our local haulers have. I believe there are two haulers here in Edina um, currently in the market who are locally owned. And um, I, I do support uh, helping local haulers. I know that at least one of them is one that's opposed to this plan. Um, I'd like to know what their current market share is and, and how we can help them um, maintain that market share in this process. So those are my questions. I think it's, I, I strongly recommend moving forward on this. We do have a waste reduction goal in the comprehensive plan. Um, I think this would help us with that. Certainly, if we can um, you know, keep track better of, of where things are going and if we can reduce the cost of things going to the landfill, that's really important um, because it, it, we'd like to see people uh, recycle and do organics recycling as well um, and reduce that solid waste that's going to landfills. And I'd like to, that's a really important goal in the comprehensive plan. And, I think this would help us understand that and move forward on that. So I'm in favor of all three of your recommendations actually to change the question on the quality of life survey. I think one of the things is in your presentation said that the question asked um, uh, the quality of life one hauler and that's not allowed by statute. So for sure in that question, I'd like to see that. Um, am I correct in that? You are correct. Yeah, so I'd like to see that corrected in the quality of life survey and then you know add some of this data that, you know, when we have organized hauling, the costs will not go up. Um, in fact, they might go down. I think that's a, an important factor for people in making their decision um, about that. So to, to uh, tweak that question, the quality of life survey. So all three of your recommendations I'm in favor of. Um, I would like to move forward with this. I think it's um, people really are fed up with the number of um, trash trucks on their street. It's kind of a stunning number of, of trucks that go by and they're loud and they're invasive. So um, I'm in favor of moving forward. Other qu uh, questions or comments? Uh, Council Member Pierce. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, there has um, certainly been um, feedback and support of this, um, but just like everything, there's support and those that don't support it, right? So that's that uh, makes sense. Um, and so what I wanted to, I had two questions, um, one question and then a suggestion. Um, in the report, um, the, the goal uh, where we're, you're saying you're not in support unless, uh, where is it, without consensus from the public. Um, and so how are we looking at defining consensus by the public? is the question. Uh, thank you for the question, Council Member Pierce. Uh, in my opinion, uh, consensus would show, would be, uh, would entail a majority of residents in the quality of life survey expressing support for organized collection um, or organized collection being recommended as an action in one of our guiding documents. As I mentioned before, it's not specifically noted in the comprehensive plan and it's briefly mentioned in the climate action mm -hmm. plan, but. Um, it's not one of the um, not one of the top actions that is noted in the climate action plan. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, so the uh, consensus in the survey would not be community consensus, um, and so it, it, when, when we say consensus, um, I interpret that almost um, if you think of it as though we're voting as a community on something. Um, the survey, even if it's all, if it's favorable, is going to still be a small percentage of the community. Um, and, but I understand why you're suggesting that. Uh, but because of that, I think that um, what it really will come down to is more of in the work plan. If that's a priority for us as a city, 
for a myriad of reasons, then I would look to the council to provide that direction or to say this is something that we want to do and these are the benefits uh, would be the way that I would, would think about this, uh, which leads me to the, the, the comments. Um, I think um, when, when we try to justify things with um, data, that's the right thing to do. But sometimes there's a bigger purpose and reason behind why we make certain decisions. Um, and so I like the point that Commissioner Jackson made about waste reduction goals, but I'd like to see how benefits like that would transpire from us having um, a single hauler of trash. Um, and so in the, if we do commission a study, um, those are the kinds of things I would be looking for. Um, I think it's, it's kind of anecdotal to say if, if there are fewer trucks on the road, then there's less wear and tear. But I love the bullet point um, in your presentation that suggested, well, there's more vehicles on the road and those, those uh, residential vehicles or uh, non-commercial vehicles provide more wear and tear than garbage hauling. Um, and so I think we just need a, uh, we need a, a frame uh, of a different way to think about this, and I would uh, would love to see that uh, we were able to put larger uh, goals that we're trying to attain and then articulate how this will help us get to that. I could get behind that. Um, one of the things that, that's really important to me is not necessarily the majority, but those that are in the margin. And so, I want to be able to sit across from them and say, I know you didn't agree with this. However, we are going for these goals. We as a city council think this is best for our city, uh, for our state, what have you. Um, and right now I, I can't, um, I couldn't sit across uh, and have that conversation with the resident, uh, but I support the concept and I would like to see us uh, do a little bit more research um, so that we understand the value uh, of doing this um, across the community. Member Anderson. Yep. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Member uh, Pierce. Thank you. I, uh, a couple of things as Member Pierce brought out and it reminded me that the city of Bloomington as they went to organized uh, collection had some issues there. Do you recall them and how would those issues that their situation apply if we decided to go forward here? Um, the, uh, in my opinion, a lot of the, some of the issues that Bloomington faced had to do with, uh, related to Bloomington being a charter city rather than a statutory city. So admittedly, I'm not sure how their challenges or the challenges that the city of St. Paul would you know, if those would be experienced in Edina necessarily. Um, okay, my, my understanding, and you probably are more knowledgeable of this than I might be. My understanding is that they were sued. They went to organized trash collection, were sued, appealed, lost, but then came back in, in order to gain consensus with a referendum where ultimately organized trash collection was approved. Um, and so if that's the case, I guess that's something that we could anticipate, not necessarily <laughs> we don't want any lawsuits here, but it might be something that we have to consider, go straight to a referendum if we get our arms around the whole thing. Now that may not be necessary, I'm not certain, but it is their experience and, and it is far better than say a quality of life survey, which as Member Pierce points out, isn't the whole community as such. It, it is a certain working percentage. The things that, that I've considered here in going to organized trash collection, I think there's merit to it. It's been kicked around for a long time and I think there's merit to going forward on some basis. It, currently, in any given neighborhood, we've got a recycling hauler uh, and we have an organic recycling hauler. Those are two different vendors. And then in most instances, there's a third trash hauler at any given residence. And then by negotiation, the, in order to get rates lower from household to household, it's normally there's some kind of renegotiation or a negotiation with still a fourth hauler. And in turn, as that multiplies through the neighborhood, that's what creates all the traffic through there. Um, and so it's, 
it's kind of a, there's an equation that has to be arrived at sooner or later in trying to figure out how do you limit that. It would be, it, it seems to me, very difficult to consolidate all of those services into one hauler. Um, somebody may not even be available to do organic recycling who may be providing regular recycling and so on and so on. So I, I, I just mentioned that um, because those are, as we go forward, those are problems we have to consider and begin to, to arrive at solutions to those. And thank you very much for your hard work. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Sutton, please. Thanks, I'd echo the comments about the great work from the Transportation Commission and from staff on this. I, I at our last meeting, I asked for us to take um, an agenda item off on the fees for organic collection because I wanted to try and explore ways that we can encourage folks to participate in greater amounts and, and see if there are any ways to align the financial incentives and. So I guess I would follow up on, on Member Pierce's comment about as we go forward, I'd like to figure out how moving to organized collection would help achieve greater participation in the organics collection. And I'd like to understand, you know, how, how organics interface with yard waste and whether they go to the same place, whether they can be um, co-mingled or not um, you know this is one of those issues that I think we need to proceed carefully because it's a front yard issue this is an issue that affects everybody and we know that people for whatever reason whether it be plowing their driveways or cutting their dog fences or taking their trash away these are the issues that get a big response and so we should be proceeding carefully as we move along. But at the same time, I see the arc from recycling that when it was first started 30 years ago, there probably wasn't as much participation and now everybody's participating and now organics were kind of on the front end of that. And how do we make it so that folks can get on board with the notion of organics recycling so that we're achieving the climate change goals that we're seeking. And at the same time, I'm sympathetic to the haulers who I do think moving to organized collection probably makes it tougher on the smaller haulers because they're gonna, they don't compete on price, they compete on service. And if we move to one, then it's going to be about price, and it's probably going to eventually elbow folks out of the way. And so I want to be thoughtful about that before we charge into it. So, so there's a lot of pieces moving here at the same time, and and I'd like to see us move forward. But um, you know, I think maybe Member Jackson's point about all three approaches, I think, that are recommended by staff, makes some sense to me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Scipioni, can you recall um, whether we had consensus from the community on composting? On, I don't think we did. Uh, that I cannot recall. Yeah, so the suggestion that we we need consensus, I mean, that's, to me, I'd like to, it, with respect to composting, we decided it was important to do and move forward on it. Um, I'm still not sure what I think about, you know, I, I like your recommendation that at this time we, we not move forward, frankly. Um, as much work as was done on this study by the Transportation Commission, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think they had a single meeting with any hauler or group of haulers to get any data from them as to, uh, as to their scope of their operations uh, maybe that's something you're thinking that we could do if we decided to go to phase two. But, but when I see the summary of the, of the work that they did and the, your summary of the work that they did, I don't see that where they had any interface with any of the existing haulers. And to me these, you know, and some of the, some of the, uh, the data that's asserted 
uh, I'd like to see some other sources on some of it to know whether it's accurate or not because these, these uh, trash haulers have multi-axle trucks that are designed to spread the weight. And so we allow them to operate on the city streets because of the manner in which they're built to displace all of that weight. So whether they, whether a single trip down the street causes additional damage, I, you know, I'm just not sure about that. I just sort of have a gut feeling that, I'm, you know, it, it gives me pause as to whether that's an accurate piece of data from wherever it came from, the MPCA or wherever it's quoted from. But what I find particularly bothersome is that no existing hauler was talked to, at least best I can tell, to get their input on these proposed areas with respect to uh, um, the efficiencies of their operations, their investments in their equipment to serve the residents of our community. Uh, some of the smaller hauler, haulers in particular, uh, one of them that's a substantial organics transporter, you know, they're buying new equipment we don't know anything about the cycle of their purchasing of uh, new equipment, uh, whether they're going to be able to depreciate if we went to organized hauling, what would be the impact on their operations, uh, not just from a capital investment standpoint, but also from the standpoint of over time as you, as you relet these contracts, if we went quadrant by quadrant and we had four haulers, one for each quadrant, you know, what's going to happen to that small carrier over time that has a, has a substantial business in the community right now? Are, are we, is, 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 do they end up inadvertently being a victim here? So I, I just feel like for myself, there's so much that's, that's uncertain right now. Um, also, we don't know staffing levels, administrative costs, um, if organized hauling were to be uh, implemented. I know that I get calls all the time from people that really want to put it on the ballot, Mayor, put it on the ballot. Let the people decide if we're going to have organized hauling or not. And Member Anderson spoke to that. Maybe that's where we'll end up here. But I, I just don't feel like we have a complete picture of the data that's relevant for us to even make a decision of whether we want to push this forward. So I'm, I'm, I'm most comfortable with your recommendation that we not move forward with organized trash hauling uh, studies, further studies at this time. And I think I'm a lonely voice here, but I'm really, I, I'm really um, uncomfortable in, without more data to decide whether or not I would vote to go forward to the next phase of doing more investigation, especially in lieu of the fact that we haven't talked to any of our existing haulers and gotten their perspective on this. Thank you for those comments, Mayor. Uh, I guess I would say uh, in defense of the commissions, I, I think there was an understanding that um, reaching out to the haulers or getting input for the haulers wasn't necessarily within the scope of their initiative. Again, the initiative was to investigate the impacts of trash collection related to traffic, um, emissions, and damage to city streets. Uh, there were a couple of um, small haulers that did reach out to staff and to the commission. They spoke at uh, Transportation Commission minute meetings, and their comments are reflected in the minutes. Um, but uh, perhaps one of the commissioners who is in attendance could speak to um, what kind of uh, dialogue they may or may not have had uh, with the haulers. Um, I believe Kirk and Jill are, are on via or virtually. Yeah, I appreciate their comments. But um, I mean, this, we got to remind ourselves this is an informational item only. Yeah. We're not taking any action on this tonight. Correct. So, but we are looking for some guidance. And Manager yeah. Neal. Yes, thank you, Your Honor, and members of council. The only thing I would add is, is that the the data that we have seen for a long time, actually, in our quality of life survey, is this is pretty consistent from year to year. And that consistent really breaks, it breaks down into half and half um, in terms of people that want us to do it and people that don't want us to do it. So I think in terms of a con community consensus, that's really your job. Your job is to consider and to declare where there's a community consensus around any, any particular issue. I think what we as staff are telling you is that it won't be easy. You know, we've looked at this from, a, from what, our, what our data tells us here. We've looked at it, uh, how this issue has played out in other communities. It just won't be an easy issue. You may decide that it's worth it. And if you decide that it's worth it, we'll certainly do our best to, to go forward with that. But that, this is where we are today. And I, I, 
for me personally, I'd like more information to know whether it's worth pushing forward. Okay. Because I, I feel like absent, and here's another thing that you were recommending here, and I think this should have been done in conjunction with the study work that was done by the Transportation Commission. They should have held those open houses. Yeah. They yeah, should have had those organized haulers in so that people could go like we did with open houses with MnDOT when they were thinking about making improvements on Highway 100. That people have a chance to come and see what's being proposed by the Transportation Commission, but they get a chance to hear from the organized haulers too as to what their position would be on things. So to me, that was all work that should have been done and come to us so that we could make a more well-informed decision. And I don't have that. And so now we're saying as a possibility we might say, yeah, we got enough information to go forward. Let's go get that information next. But um, why put staff and people through that effort if we don't have to? I mean, this is something that should have been done before. So in my opinion, uh, as part of the information gathering um, that went on. So I don't know, others probably have some other thoughts. So yeah. mem Member Jackson, I know yeah. you've been here to speak. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I guess, that's kind of what I was reading into the recommendations um, that we, if we were to go forward, was to have that open house. I would love to have that open house um, and, and hear from the haulers. I think that's a really important data point, and, um, and I, I would like to hear from them because, as it is, uh, we, we don't have the full picture, and uh, I think their voice is really important. Ever appear? Yeah, I see something. Yes, who is on the line? Uh, this is uh, Jill Plum Smith. I'm the vice chair yes. of the ETC. Sure yes. So, in regarding, uh, uh, th thank you for um, taking my comments. So, um, we were contacted um, by Paul Rosland of, uh, I believe, uh, Suburban Waste, and he did express his concerns about um, market share and and um, all the things that would happen in an organized system, but. To, uh, to, uh, or from my perspective, I didn't understand that I would actually have the option of holding a meeting with, with haulers. And so we really did stick to um, exactly what the initiative said. Had, had we known that, that would have been easy to organize to get that information. Um, but I think in hindsight, I'm not sure if that's helpful, but um, we did have contact with the haulers. And we set up a meeting with Paul specifically. He didn't show up, and Andrew did talk to him and addressed his questions. And then in a following um, ETC meeting, uh, we all addressed his questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, thanks for that uh, um, articulation of your scope of work as you understood it. Um, what I was thinking about is a situation where, and we've got this going on right now in the Cahill District, one of the first things you do is you have a big community meeting and, and you have people come and they, they, they talk about being involved in a project. We've done that, I think, on every small area plan. Right off the bat, there's a, a wide range of folks involved. There are uh, information stations that people can get uh, information on a particular issue. It, it seemed to me like that should have been part of the process at the beginning, that people provide input to the Transportation Commission uh, at the very front end of this whole study and that we don't just get um, the view of a review of data and the opinions of other communities in the, in the scope of things. Now that, I hear the Commissioner saying that that, that, wasn't their, that wasn't their task, that wasn't their defined scope of work. Well, I'm, I regret that it wasn't, if that's true. You know, I'm, I'm assuming it is, yeah, these are, folks that were trying to act within the scope of what they were told to do. So, but it just seems kind of backwards now to say, okay, this looks promising, let's go to the next step. It's, it's, it's just not the way we've done things. And I, I don't know what the solution is, but it feels awkward to me that we're here trying to decide whether to go forward to the next step and, and uh, the input of the people who make their living from hauling this trash in our town, their voice wasn't even heard in the course of putting, in, uh, putting together the report. <clears throat> How can you say you got a broad range of opinion before you wrote your report or reached the conclusions you wrote when you didn't get all the information? 
Member Pierce. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I, so I, um, I, I think I agree with where you're, you're going. I interpreted this though as similar to um, Member Jackson. Um, one of the bullet points in the recommendation is to do the study. And so that's, that's kind of what I was referring to. What I was trying to reset though, is that for us to make a decision as a council, I can't rely on the consensus side of this because unless we do some kind of referendum, we won't actually have, we won't be able to say it's a consensus. Um, and so then the other thing I was trying to do, and this may make it even more complicated, um, but was to raise the goals of what we're going after. And so it's different if we're saying we want to do this and we don't have data to support this to your point yet, but it could come from the study um, that we want to do this because we believe there will be a reduction in landfill waste because a particular hauler, uh, you know, they, they handle the waste differently than another hauler. Uh, but we don't have those those details at this point. Uh, and then the other thing I would say, I, I wasn't even at the point of saying service versus cost. Um, and I know lots, uh, lots of people are thinking that it could be cheaper. I'm not even thinking that. If you told me it, it might be a couple dollars more expensive to do this, but it's going to help us get more done in our climate action plan, I might internalize that differently as well. But we don't have the data today to, to assess that. So I was, was expecting that if we went forward, I wouldn't waste time with changing the question on the survey. Uh, maybe we have to do that, I don't know. I would spend the time in doing the community meeting, in collecting, data from other communities, uh, talking to the trash haulers, figuring out how we would we, we might do this. And the question I didn't get to that um, I didn't ask is it would be helpful to understand what is the cost to the city to do that? And if that's an exorbitant cost, then, then I could say, well, maybe we shouldn't expend that energy and resources at this point. Uh, but again, we don't have all of that in front of us just yet. So that's how I was thinking about it. Member Stanton's got some thoughts, and then this has caused me to think about a, a pathway too. So go ahead, Member Stanton, or a potential pathway. Well, I was just going to say we need to lighten up a little bit. <laughs> I, I think they took a nice crack at getting this thing started. That's what we asked them to do. And this, is, this has been an issue. I've been hearing about this ever since I ran for office, you know. It's been at least five or six or seven years of people come up to you and say both ways, you know. So I think it's worth talking about in the community. I think the Transportation Commission has teed up a nice, a nice starting point to talk about that, and we should start having that conversation and figure out the best way to do that. And, and I agree with Member Pierce that we ought to, you know, we ought to look at these pieces. Is it going to you know, does going to a single hauler make an appreciable difference in emissions from vehicles or in wear and tear in the streets? But that's one set. The more important set in my mind is what's it doing about our climate change goals, our solid waste management? How are we gonna be more, how, how are we gonna create better incentives for everybody to do the right thing? And so I'm, I'm cool with us starting that conversation and and as we do it we'll probably stumble a few more times and you know we just need to figure out how to start having the conversation all those are important issues i think that have been raised uh, succinctly by member stoughton what i was thinking was what if we sent this back to the transportation commission and asked them for an amended report but instructed them to go out and do the things that are suggested in your report and maybe that's just a different way of saying the same things that other people are saying mm -hmm. but i you know i think it i think the i think the responsibility <laughs> on gathering all of the relevant data ought to be on the transportation commission not on the city council so if we sent it back to them with an enlarged scope of work and asked them to do the things we would do in 
uh, for example, in a, in a land use situation or a small area study, go back out, hold those open houses, get that relevant input from all of the organized haulers uh, so that we understand what their view is on all of these issues that are so important with respect to greenhouse gas reduction, wear and tear on the streets, um, traffic, you know, flow of traffic, big trucks through the neighborhoods. We get six haulers, I think, that are authorized to do business in the, in the city of Edina. Wow. Uh, they've all got something, I'm sure, that they want to tell us, and they haven't had a chance to do that yet. But Mr. it also Mayor. seems like there's, I mean, transportation is one dynamic, but energy and environment might be another piece to the puzzle because they've got such a good kind of input on the climate change efforts that we're trying to pursue. And, and so I think this is a good start, and we should figure out, maybe staff can work with the various commissions to figure out what's the right way to tee this up and to frame the questions that we're trying to examine. There, there is a formal process, and we were just talking about this, that all cities have to follow in order to pursue the, the organized trash collection um, process, if you, if you will. And you want to talk about it a little bit? Here? Yeah. Mr. Mayor, member of the council, there, there is a formal process at a next step, and if the city does want to consider this, the city is required to establish a solid waste collections options committee and there is a defined scope of that committee's work and that includes among other things talking with the haulers involved so there is a process for this if you want to move forward with it that would probably be the next step to comply with that statutory requirement that's not been carried out yet by the transportation <coughs> commission but it could be carried out by the solid waste collection options committee appointed by the city if you want to proceed further and if, and if that is the direction you wish to go, we can put that together in the form of a resolution or, or motion and bring that to you at one of your meetings in January. Well, it sounds like maybe, maybe we would need an interim step before we get to that to frame up some of these questions that the council members have been kind of identifying and figure out how to, you know, is this about emissions? Is this about wear and tear on the streets? Is this about encouraging better solid waste disposal what you know and depending on which issues we want to pursue maybe there's another way to encourage better solid waste management that has nothing to do with how many trucks we have out there i don't know mr scipioni uh, scipioni um we've got i think several views of your recommendation here w would you articulate for us what your recommendation is and whether that recommendation is consistent with what we're talking about now? Uh, sure, uh, Mr. Mayor. So sickly staff recommendation, again, I think the operative words here is we don't recommend moving forward with organized trash collection at this time. We believe that more study is needed and more data is needed, particularly related to those staffing levels and those administrative costs um, so that we know what we're getting into if we do move forward. All right, so that makes sense, and that would be something you could provide to us in the sure. context of some further work. So to Member Staunton's point, uh, Mr. Kendall, um, could, we, could we send this back, let's say, to the Transportation Commission and the Environment Commission to get all that input that we talked about up here? Uh, or would that all be information that we would get within the scope of what would occur after we established, potentially established a solid waste working group or however you characterize it under the statute? Mr. Mayor uh, and members of council, I, I think you could probably do it either way, but it, it would probably be somewhat repetitious. So the, the work mm. would be duplicated if you sent it back to the Transportation Commission and have them do that work. And then you'd be required after that to establish this uh, additional committee and then do it all again and basically do a lot of it again or do it all again so you just want to, might, might want to consider whether that would end up duplicating the the work that you're looking to have completed so there's nothing about this committee we could be over inclusive of what the statute inquiry requires us to do with this committee right i mean we can do more than what there what the statute requires in terms of just the straight hauling we could also examine the whole well, how best to accomplish our solid waste goals, et cetera. 
the statute. And that way, if it turned out that we wanted that organized hauling looked like a way to achieve those goals, then we will have checked that box and be able to move to the next stage. Mayor, Member Staunton, I think that's correct. Um, the statute d describes the minimum requirements. It doesn't put a, a cap, so you could direct it to include additional requirements or an additional scope as long as you satisfy the minimum requirements. Our, our hope tonight was just to share this report with you and have some discussion <laughs> and then bring and, and then and then look for an action in in January at one of our two meetings after oh, you've had a chance well, to well, think about it. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if there was going to be an action. All right. Did you get a sense that our council had the same thoughts as uh, the community on organized hauling? <laughs> yeah, it's kind absolutely. of up in the air. This, I just want. I think it's or, important for us just to all acknowledge this is a difficult issue, and it it raises difficult political issues in the community for sure. Um, we see it time and time again. So it's something that we want to make sure we have solid footing on before we go forward. Well, we've never shied away from difficult political issues. Mm -hmm. I think it makes more sense to look at it based on these other issues that have been raised up here. But I guess maybe the, the next step is finding out what we'd need to do if we wanted to go forward from a statutory standpoint. Okay. So uh, and we can we can think about that. We'll take a little bit of time from a staff perspective to put that together for you then. And to the, to the extent that anybody from the Transportation Commission was off put or offended by my comments about the scope of your work. If that year, you know, my apologies. Um, it sounds like you did exactly what you were asked to do. So, um, may, never, may, the mayor's comment, never mind. <laughs> With respect to your work, it was a good piece of work for what you were instructed to do. Um, okay. All right. So, you got enough direction yep, here to we do. We'll, 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 we'll think about it some more. I do. Thank you. We'll have something in front of us to look at to decide where we want to go next. Okay. Thanks, folks. Um, thanks, Mr. Scipioni. Thank you. And thanks, uh, Commissioners Johnson and Jill Plum Smith and uh, Commissioner Richmond. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes the uh, uh, special recognitions and presentations portion of the agenda. And um, now we're gonna move on to the public hearing portion of the agenda. And we've got one matter here to talk about, and Director Teague has it. And it's a potential adoption of an ordinance, um, but with respect to how we've been running these public hearings in the virtual world will take testimony tonight and then we'll leave the matter open. At least that'll be the suggestion to close the public hearing at noon on Monday, December 27th, and then continue it to our January 4th, 2022 City Council meeting for action. So Director Teague, go ahead. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor, members of the council. So this ordinance that's in front of you, uh, includes several items that were on the 2021 work plan for the, for the Planning Commission. Uh, the most substantive item is the establishment of an impervious surface ordinance in the R1 zoning district. That's the district where our single family homes are located. To uh, go about this task, the Planning Commission established a working group of Commissioners Miranda, Bennett, and Strauss, along with engineering and planning staff. When this was put on the Planning Commission work plan, we were thought to be, um, one of the focuses was to address the issue, um, the ongoing issue that the city has experienced complaints on in regard to drainage from neighbor to neighbor. Um, so to, uh, to help assist with this, engineering staff provided a, a bunch of uh, background studies uh, and work uh, for the Planning Commission to consider as they were I'm considering establishing an impervious surface maximum. Currently the city has a building coverage maximum but not an impervious surface. So what I thought I would do here is stop there, have Director Milner go through some of those background studies that was considered uh, by the Planning Commission 
and then once that's concluded, then I will, I'll, I will um, go through each section of the ordinance and kind of summarize what's in front of you. So with that, Director Milner. Thank you. Mr. Teague, so as part of the 2018 Comprehensive Water Resource Management Plan and the Morningside Flood Risk Reduction Strategy, we looked at the impervious surfaces in our stormwater model. Within our model, we had assumptions put in there from 2008 when that Comprehensive Water Resource Management Plan was originally done. So with that 2018 and 19 update, we actually looked in within neighborhoods, looked at aerial photography and tried to put numbers of impervious on different land uses. And then we compared what we actually measured, what our consultant measured, and what was in the model, and we found it was pretty accurate. So knowing that the Planning Commission was working on this, we decided to turn the dials. Let's assume that everybody doubles their impervious. Would that really trigger some big uh, stormwater problems for neighbors in the neighborhoods? Or let's turn it down in half. Let's get everybody gets rid of their driveways. Would that change the dial on stormwater? What we learned is that in either case, it does not change the dial by making an uh, impervious limit uh, either really high or really low. It's really climate change that is driving our stormwater issues and within the city. So with knowing that knowledge, we think there's some other uh, benefits of having a impervious limit that Director Teague will go through here uh, just now. And I'd be happy to stand for any questions on the studies as you go through and hear more about this ordinance change. Thank you, Director Milner. So, yeah, as as um, Chad stated, the Planning Commission still felt it was important to move move forward with um, an impervious surface ordinance for protection of green space, providing opportunity for trees to be planted, um, and maybe it could address that neighbor to neighbor drainage issue. You know, it's not the big picture, but it, it might help in those regards too. Um, so the ordinance that's in front of you, the first section, so there's, there's additional items um, included within this ordinance in addition to the impervious surface, and I'll go through those. But uh, the first section is in regard to definitions. And we have added a definition of impervious surface. We have amended the building coverage requirement to not include patios. Currently, patios are included within the building coverage requirement. Those would be covered under the impervious surface requirement now. Also, there's a number of uh, definition amendments to setbacks. You may recall with the design experience guidelines in the Southdale area, we've changed how we measure setbacks from the face of the building to a face of a curb. When we made that amendment about a year ago or so, we did not amend the definition section of the code. So this is clarifying, clarifying that. So, uh, section two and section five, again, building coverage is clarified to eliminate patios, um, tennis courts, similar uses. Again, those are regulated under the new impervious surface requirement. And um, the impervious surface lot coverage regulation is established for that R1 zoning district with a maximum of 50%. So what went into the recommendation of, of 50%? It's, we did a survey of cities that demonstrated, well, as you uh, see in the survey, most of the surrounding uh, communities don't have an impervious surface regulation. Cities that do, that are similar to Edina, similar to Edina in regard to lot sizes. Um, city of Minneapolis has a 60% um, maximum requirement and the city of New Brighton, which has similar lot sizes, uh, has a 50% regulation. We also, within those engineering studies, saw the existing conditions within Morningside and the Country Club. There are some properties that do exceed 50%, um, uh, more so in Morningside, but there are some in the Country Club as well. We also ran some examples within Country Club um, and found that many are just below the 50%. Again, there are some that are over. So those, those uh, properties that are over 50%, they become legal existing non-conforming uses, similar to any time we change the ordinance in regards to setbacks uh, when we increase setbacks, we're creating non-conformities out there. So we would be creating some non-conforming properties. They can continue, they just can't 
expand. So we wouldn't go to individual properties and make them comply with the 50%. They could continue to exist. But any time a house is torn down and rebuilt, they would have to comply with, with that new with that new regulation. So the, the, the commission was comfortable looking at those things with the 50% um, suggestion or recommendation. Sections three and four deals with basements and first floor elevations or what we call the one foot rule. So with this ordinance, we would eliminate the requirement to install a basement with a new home. Currently any, any new home that's, that's constructed, a basement is required. The thought here is it, it could uh, assist with reduction in uh, the cost of housing for um, new homes. Also with properties with a uh, high water table, sometimes they struggle. Can they even get a basement in because of the, the high water table? So with this ordinance, it just gives them the option to not have to construct a basement. Uh, the second section is in regard to the one foot rule. So back in 2014, the city created an ordinance that said anytime you tear down a house, the first floor elevation of the new house can't exceed the, the one foot or the, the first floor elevation by more than one foot from the previous house. So since that time in 2014, the city has processed and approved 23 variances. And again, it's uh, when these come before us, it's because of a high water table issue. Uh, our code also requires any, the low floor elevation of any new home has to be at least two feet above that low floor elevation. So that bumps up against that one foot rule. Um, if they desire to have a basement, um, there's just not enough space to still meet that one foot rule. So what this ordinance does is allows that by right, there are two conditions um, that would have to be met, and these were pretty, these were standard conditions that the Planning Commission would put on these variances when they um, were seeking to exceed that one foot rule. And that is that the low floor elevation is no higher than two and a half feet above that low water elevation, and that the basement ceiling height be no taller than nine feet. Um, nine feet we've determined to be a reasonable um, ceiling height for a basement in Edina. We've, we've had some requests where they wanted 11 and 12 feet where it really pops that one foot rule. And the, the commission was pretty routine in requiring a nine foot basement, a uh, nine foot ceiling height. The, uh, <clears throat> and the sixth section is again, just clarifying the how setbacks are measured in the greater Southdale district. So with that, as the mayor mentioned, we are recommending that you close the public hearing at noon on December 27th and continue action to the January 4th um, at your January 4th meeting. And with that, we can answer any questions you may have before the public hearing. Thank you. Questions for Director Teague or Director Milner? Yes, Member Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so Mr. Teague, Having seen 15 tornadoes in December of this year, um, I always think of basements as being um, shelters for tornadoes. What's historically the reason we have basements in houses? Boy, that, that's a, a good question. I, I don't know specifically why that, um, that requirement is. I believe it's somewhat unique to Edina. I've, in other cities I've worked in, I don't recall a requirement that you had to have a basement. Perhaps Mr. Milner has some more information. I don't on that one, but if it's storm related, we've, you can still build a, sor a storm rated structure within the home at the level of the grade. So you can reinforce walls to create kind of a storm room that's not a basement if that's of a concern. Okay, yeah. That's, a, that's what the city of Lakeville does. Okay. On, on, at least on townhomes. Okay. They allow them to build them slab on grade, but they've got to have a tornado room you know, within the, within the structure, a, a room where they can, it's reinforced walls and uh, some kind of a deadbolt system to bolt the door so they can have some protection in the event of a tornado. Yeah, I guess that's something that, that I, I'm very concerned about the risk of tornadoes. So I, I would wanna make sure that that was still continued. Um, we had that protection. Um, so I don't know how we that works. We can take a look at that ordinance of theirs. Okay, yeah. So that, that's my primary question with this. Thank you. 
Other questions? I, I see one of our residents and developers is here, builders, but I, he had an interesting um, observation, I thought, and uh, he may express it better than I do, but in the, in the comments, uh, better together, he raised the issue of um, whether we also ought to be thinking about exempting uh, front porches from lot coverage, uh, seeing this proliferation of, of porches and more more people wanting to be out in front of their house and better engagement with the street and their neighborhood. Um, did uh, did that get any consideration at the Planning Commission? It, it did. Um, the Planning Commission did not move that language. Um, but it is fair to say that within the building coverage ordinance, uh, ordinance that 50% credit or 50 square foot credit is going away with this ordinance. What's also going away is patios are calculated within building coverage that goes away too, whether that's an equal wash because not everybody has a patio that's counted. Um, but that is something that the council could consider is putting that uh, 50 square foot credit back in. All right, thank you. Other, did that prompt any questions for staff? All right, this is a public hearing matter. We're gonna open it up now for public testimony. Just as a reminder, uh, folks, if you're, if you're listening online and wanna testify, uh, we're gonna take people that are in the council chambers first, but if you wanna testify Virtually call 800-374-0221, conference ID 464-5228. Uh, give them your name, address, uh, phone number, and press star one, and Director Benerod will bring you in when it's your, your opportunity to testify. So let's go ahead now that we're opening this up for public testimony and invite folks in the audience to come forward and give their thoughts with regard to these uh, proposed changes from the Planning Commission. Julie Risser, I live at 6112 Ashcroft Avenue. And although it is being presented as just a formality, I do want you to really think hard about the fact that um, moving the way the setback is calculated from the lot line to the curb in the Southdale area is a really big deal, particularly doing it this month, the same month that you approved a climate action plan. Okay, so I really think that it would be good to be very transparent about how this could be really reducing the amount of pervious surface, the ability to put in bike paths, the ability to widen pedestrian pathways, to plant trees, to do all of that. How much land is being lost? So that's a question that I wanna put out there. The other thing, this is just one little part of the area. And um, so here's the lot line on this parcel. And you can see that you know there's areas where we have some big healthy chunks. Are those being acknowledged at all? How are those gonna be preserved? The other thing that I would like to point out is that there's sort of a level of absurdity in um, making patios apart from the building coverage. And what I'm showing you here is a plan for a building where you have the entire building below ground sailing past the setback line. And then on top of that space, you have the patio. So how often does that happen in Edina where you have below ground the coverage of the building exceeding and going past the setback? And so when you do aerial photography, what does that mean? Do we have a lot of foundations? And I have photographs of this whole process being done. So it just seems kind of nonsensical. Finally, with slab architecture, it would be really good if we had a lot of stipulations about how that's done especially because this is Minnesota, and you need to have a certain thickness of the slab. You also may need to make sure that the builder is not doing it when it's like 15 below zero. So, you know, just kind of being very mindful that we should be looking. I believe the city of Fargo has a lot of stipulations on how you do slab architecture. There are places in Minnesota where it is 
approved, and I really think we should move very cautiously on that. Thank you for your time, and on that note, happy solstice. Thank you, Ms. Risser. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, Mayor and Council. Thanks so much for uh, considering this um, ordinance change. I'm Scott Buesen. I live at 4633 Arden Avenue. Uh, I'm a home builder in EDAT. I built about 75 uh, new homes in the city. Um, I did. I testified at the 1117 Planning Commission meeting because um, I felt uh, overall this, these ordinance changes are real workable for how we build homes. The, the, uh, the two-foot uh, limit and the, uh, the uh, pervious surface uh, proposals work well with how we build homes in Edan. I, I don't have any issues with those. Um, but I, I do have an issue with removing the um, 50 square foot exemption for front porches from building coverage. Uh, I feel front porches are an integral part of our neighborhood community and I'd hate to see any changes to ordinance which would deter uh, homeowners from uh, building them. The, um, as written, the draft deletes the uh, 50 square foot exemption from criteria and I think this would discourage residents from uh, considering building front porches. Um, I think the front porch is an American icon and you go around the country and front porches always have a real welcoming look. Uh, they connect families to the outside. Uh, they bring them out to enjoy the block with their neighbors. Uh, it's an area that shares the sanctity of the home with the community outside. Uh, and I think in a world changed by the COVID-19 pandemic, we've, we've seen when people are home, there's been a resurgence of people out in their yards and engaging their neighbors. Um, and so it's had a renaissance. Uh, with people spending more time home, I think it's more evident that front yards in Edina have become the connection point between neighbors. Uh, front porches make a more welcoming and connected uh, feel with the neighborhood. I feel strongly that they're an important part of our Edina neighborhood culture since they represent family, community, and being outside, even when it's five below. Uh, with the recent uptake in, uh, in crime, I think it's also important we can uh, continue to promote front porches. Uh, front porches build uh, are built in neighborhood security by encouraging people to be outside and having more eyes on the neighborhood. Um, from an architectural standpoint, front porches also reduce the massing of a home. Uh, the home facades are easier on the eye uh, when they open up slowly from the street with a front porch and then the second story versus if you see just a two-story facade. So I think like anything when you design, if you've got layering, uh, it, it reduces the overall mass of the home. Um, zoning guidelines in our neighbor, neighboring cities are also promoting the importance of front porches. Uh, Minneapolis excludes front porches from their FAR calculations um, and gives design points for homes with have it, which have at least 70 square feet of front porch. Uh, St. Louis Park uh, last few years uh, updated their zoning to reduce the setback of front yard patios as they saw that people were using their, their front yards. I think if you drive around Edan, you, you see that, uh, not only the front porches, but people starting to you know, have chairs outside. They, some people maybe have a fire pit, uh, but they become kind of the, you know, the social uh, point with their neighbors. Um, and I, I read uh, Council Member Anderson's uh, column in the recent Sun Current, and I, I would, it struck me how uh, he felt the same way I did. How the I, a quote he had in there: "The inherent benefit of knowing and associating with neighbors at a street level can increase watchfulness and in safer neighborhoods." So, um, so as I stated, I think that. Uh, uh, as written, uh, the draft excluding front porches, uh, taking that away, uh, the something exi that exists today um, would, would hurt, uh, I think, the, uh, hurt our streets on Edina. Um, and I think it also unfairly impacts smaller lots more so than larger lots, because those lots have a 2,250 square foot cap on them. And uh, these are lots where, um, you know, they're closer to more Edina's urban core, and we've seen you know, a little more uh, of an uptick on, on crime in these areas here, so. All right, I'll let you drift over quite a bit, Mr. Busen. I'm sorry. It's, um, so would you, would you either tell us what your recommendation is with respect to the ordinance change or, or put it in writing for us? Yes. What, what's, your, what's your idea of the solution to this, of maintaining the front porch? Yes, I mean, I, I, the Planning Commission, I recommended having a 100-foot um, uh, exemption from building coverage uh, in the ordinance. It's currently 50. Um, but, but I think 50 works. It'd be great to see it go to 100 because it's typically they're building them, you know, somewhere around 100 square feet out okay. in front of the home. So, all right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience wish to testify on this matter? Yes. Please come forward.
orange one. Yeah, orange. Yeah. Side to side, up and down. Oh, looks like up and down. Okay. Okay, that's good. Okay, I'm going to, uh, Roberta Castellano, 4854 France Avenue South. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, as always. Um, uh, I would just like to read this. I'm still researching this. Um, I, uh, in the preliminary research that I did on how the setbacks have been changed, it's, um, uh, it's unacceptable. And um, so I'll just read this. Without integrity, there is no democracy. Today's example, in what is merely the latest in a series of displays of contempt for the public, the city of Edina again dis demonstrates an intent to mislead the public, make dupes of any unknowing city leaders, and undermine the public hearing process while underhandedly advancing personal motives, suggesting inappropriate relationships with members of the development community and unscrupulous and perhaps unlawful personal rewards as yet undisclosed. So I still have to do a little bit more research. But um, in, in what I initially had identified was that, um, what I discovered was that the Southdale Design Experience Guidelines, uh, that that the guidelines that were put into that were um, not in alignment with the city code, that, that they were contradictory to city code, and, uh, for example, with regard to setbacks, but not only with regard to setbacks, also I'm finding now with height. But um, the public wasn't told about that. So then at some point, some of the setback information from the Southdale guide, uh, guidelines was plugged into the zoning code. And it was done without telling people that, that you were making changes to um, the definition of setback and that you were reducing the setbacks throughout the, in the Southdale area. But it's more complex than that, even, I found out. So, um, what I showed here is uh, this is how the zoning code looks right now, is what you see on screen, and I added some highlighting there. So it suggests that, um, that the setbacks, that what was loaded in from the design experience guidelines for any other street other than France and York, that the 30-foot setback is required from face of curb to face of building. Now we're gonna go over here. Um, the language in the code that you're shown as being corrected is, is falsified and appears to be deleting a dangling phrase. It matters what it is because the source, there's a difference between a 30 foot setback and, and with a podium height of 60 feet. And the 60 feet was referring specifically to room typology for primary east west streets and those are the streets that were involved. But um, we have to look also at, at um, the Edina City Code as to why the 60 feet was important. And that's because there's building height restrictions in the code. And that helps to reinforce 30 foot setback across the board hits all those locations in the greater Southdale district, whereas the um, phrase that's, that's in there that's Carrie's telling you to remove with a building podium height of 60 feet clearly meant for buildings that were in the higher air, uh, height areas, those streets that are highlighted there. So um, what he's proposing is an across the board change that would especially have a, a deleterious impact on Cornelia and South Cornelia. And this whole thing is just, it's just so unbelievably deceptive. So um, I'm gonna continue to work on it and hopefully make an additional submission, but I'm really, really disappointed that this has moved forward, even after my calling it out previously back in August with the 4040 West 70th Street. So oh, I'm out of breath, thank you. Thank you.
Do you want us to, we'll, we've got your presentation now, we'll make it part of the record. Sure. As you take your thumb drive back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's recorded too, so yeah, good point. Is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to testify regarding this matter? All right, let's turn to our uh, online, potential online testifiers. Are there any folks waiting to testify, Director Benarat? Yes, sir. Our first caller tonight is Ms. Lori Groats. Operator, will you please unmute Ms. Groats's line? And Ms. Groats, please begin by stating your full name and address for the record. Go ahead, Ms. Groats. Operator, will you please put um, open Lori's line? There we go. Go ahead, Lori. Can you hear me now? We can, Ms. Groats. Go ahead. Okay, before I guess I was just talking to myself. Lori Groats, 5513 Park Place. I think this amendment only deals with a part of the quotient. You're talking about impervious surface, but what you're not talking about is where the storm water is allowed to drain. When you're dealing with teardowns, you're dealing with a blank slate. That's the time that you can go in and easily make changes for grading, it's cheap, it's efficient, that is the time to be doing it. Right now, the stormwater drainage policy in Edina is, with a teardown, you can't give your neighbor any greater quantity of water or at a greater force than what previously existed. So. If a neighbor was causing drainage problem for their next door neighbor, after the new house is built, they can still cause that same amount of trouble. That makes absolutely no sense. It makes for bad neighbors. I've seen many times in the city where the grading plans on the as-built do not match what was on the plan. The plans are approved, the as-built is approved, certificate of occupancy is given, and once that happens, now it becomes a civil issue between two neighbors. And when you start hiring attorneys, as several of our council members will understand, that gets expensive. I've seen many situations over the years where neighbors have had to sell their house due to the drainage problems caused from the new build. A lot of the times it's the elderly who cannot afford to deal with this. What happens, the house gets torn down and then another big home is built. But then perhaps that's what the city is looking for. I would say that you, what you need to address is where this drainage water can go and specifically for teardowns, I would say they need to deal with the water on their property or otherwise direct it to a public street or direct it to a public waterway. It's very, very inexpensive for a builder to put this in and make it correct. I have also seen with new builds afterwards, the new homeowner has problems with drainage on their own property and then they need to bring somebody else in to change the drainage. And then usually again, what happens? You usually drain it to the neighbor. You need to address both sides of the equation and you're not doing that right now. So I think it's finally time to address drainage. You've been dancing around it for about 10 years and you have to realize builders are not the only ones that make the decisions in town. The city council should be making those decisions. We had a decent tree ordinance until the builders got a hold of it and it got watered down and we don't have much of a tree ordinance anymore. So you better deal with the drainage. 
Thank you so much for your time and assistance. It was greatly appreciated. Thank you, Ms. Groats. I have no other callers on the line at this time. We'll wait a moment or two and then we'll move on to a potential motion, but also maybe get some clarification from Director Teague on some of these concerns that have been expressed. Are you seeing anyone coming on line? Okay, good, thank you. All right, well, let's go back to, we had uh, uh, Julie Risser and Scott Buson and Roberta Castellano, Lori Groats testify. Uh, the issues raised by Ms. Risser, would you have any comment there? Correct, Rajeek, any clarification you wanna make? She did reference patios. Um, Right now, patios, and this is for R1 properties, single family homes, the graphic that she showed was for a commercial property, so those regulations don't apply, other than we do require setbacks to patios. That project received variances um, for those setbacks that she was referring to. But in regard to currently patios are calculated as part of building coverage. That is taken out of the building coverage requirement, it would now be covered under impervious surface. So it's still covered by ordinance. Um, and again, setbacks do apply to patios. All right, thank you. And then um, uh, Mr. Busen uh, suggests uh, a 100 foot exemption that would allow the builders to build a front porch on a house that uh, was, I guess, um, Consistent with the with the structure itself, but uh, more conducive to a, a welcoming sort of environment. He has several several reasons reasons he expressed as to why he thought that would be a good idea. Your thoughts, sir? Yeah, uh, my thoughts would be that the the staff would be comfortable with leaving in the 50 foot exemption. When Mr. Busen um, emailed me, and I I'm not sure if these pictures were included in the email that I forwarded to the the council today. But he provided some pictures of existing ho of homes that have recently been built, and they showed that 50 square foot porch exception, and they really do add a lot of character to the homes. Not saying as the ordinance as adopted today, you could still you could still have a front porch. It would just be calculated within your your building coverage. Um, so staff would be more comfortable with with leaving that 50 percent. Um, okay. if, if that's the wish of the council. All right, then Roberta Castellano expressed some concerns about uh, setback requirements in the Southdale district. And I think, I think she was getting at some apparent inconsistencies that she saw, or maybe even thought that we might've been misleading or the city was misleading the public in some way on some of the setbacks. Thoughts there? Yeah, so comments? the intent here is really to clarify the ordinance. The graphic that was pointed to, uh, that was highlighted on the screen, um, well, the intent here is, again, to clarify, to require a 30-foot setback from the face of a curb to the structure, and then anything that steps in that is taller than 60 feet requires that that um, step in of the second level. So with the, so the way the ordinance reads now, I'll, I'll try to clarify this. Uh, a 30 foot setback is required from the face of curb to the face of building within a, ho a podium height of 60 feet. What I'm trying to clarify there is we have some structures that aren't even 60 feet tall. So does that provision count? Because it's saying it only includes um, that type of a building with a podium height of 60 feet. So I'm, we're removing that provision. So the setback requirement is just 30 feet to any height, but once a building is taller than 60 feet, they then need to step it in. So the intent here is trying to clarify that. I don't believe the, the wording was clear. 
um, with that original with that original ordinance amendment. And again, we didn't include when we changed the ordinance, we didn't change the definitions. Um, so with this ordinance, we're adding the definition, so it's clear throughout the code. Right. So the, the 30 foot setback from the face of the curb to the building is is consistent regardless of the height of the building, and if it's over 60 feet, there's further setback required based on the based on the language in the code. Correct. If it's taller than 60 feet, then they need to start stepping the building in. Okay. And then uh, Ms. Groats was uh, concerned about uh, addressing drainage uh, water or stormwater uh, and how it's allowed to drain off of a uh, site, in particular a, a teardown rebuild situation. And I think her goal would be to make sure that we manage that stormwater on the site itself. And uh, either Director Milner or you can comment on what the city does to make sure that uh, there's no water going on to other properties uh, greater in amount than what was there, what was going there before. So at least that's my understanding. Yeah, I think that's different from the ordinance you're looking at tonight, that concern she raised, but we review existing conditions, where the water is going in the existing state, and then when a new home comes in, we look at those proposed conditions, and we don't we do exactly what you say, Mayor, is don't pinpoint new drainage on your neighbors, and don't increase the uh, flow or the volume to your neighbors. So we review all those, and adjustments are made during construction, but we continue to hit those standards throughout that project, and then the as-builts are required to meet that standard. Good. Uh, colleagues, did I miss anything on the questioning side of things? All right. Um, Director Teague requested that we have a motion to close the public hearing at noon on Monday, December 27th, and then, this, and then take this matter up for decision on our January 4th, uh, at our January 4th, 2022 City Council meeting. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. So Anderson moves, member Pierce seconds. All right. Um, so Mr. Mayor. Yes, discussion. I, I, I will confess I'm a little confused by all this. So I, I do have a couple more questions. Sure, go ahead. Um, so Mr. Teague, overall, by putting these, uh, lim the 50% permeable build, is this going to decrease the amount of permeable surfaces or impermeable surfaces on a lot, or I'm, I'm thinking on my lot, my house isn't anywhere close to 50%. Right now, if I were to tear it down and rebuild it, you know, it's on a larger lot. You know, I, I guess I'm, I'm confused. Is this a limit or an expansion of the amount of impermeable surface? It, it, it is a limit. Right now, we have no limit. So you could go, today you could, you could pave your entire property Wow. <laughs> and then to, to what Mr. Busen is talking about, you know, I read his emails and, and his comments, and I'm still a little confused. Um, I guess I just don't have any sort of architecture understanding. So if we have the porch, I, I guess I don't understand the porch as part of the permeable sur or impermeable surface or the por porch as part of the building. You know, if our goal is to have as much a green space or permeable surface as possible, which one has more um, uh, impermeable surface? So, so I am, I'm confused. Yes, so the porch would be included in the impervious surface calculation. So anything that has a roof is included. What he's asking for is an exception for the mass of the building. He would get a 50 foot, or a 50 square foot um, exception to the the building coverage requirement, but it's still calculated in the impervious surface. <laughs> so currently, can I, can I try and John, yeah. so yeah. so building impervious surface includes all building coverage, but not all building coverage includes pervious, impervious surface. Yes. So impervious surface is not only the building but other stuff too. Right. So. I, I, you know, I think what Mr. Busen is getting at is this change will discourage porches, and and I'm just I'm lost. I'm well, sorry. Well, he's saying that that you should get your 30 percent plus an extra 50 feet to put a porch on. In yep. the in the building building coverage. part, not yeah. in the previous surface. 
Right, which would all be part of your impervious surface right, calculation. Right, right, okay. Yes. But all you right. still have another 20% after that if we did a 50% impervious surface. Okay, so I Am have I some, that some, right? yep, that's some exactly. logic homework to do between now and January 4th. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Member Anderson. Um, I apologize, I've made a motion to approve and I still do have a question. Um, and this is for Director Teague. Um, driveways. How are you handling driveways? They are counted as part of the... Unless they could be built with, say, pervious paper so that there's drainage, correct? Correct. And so would those then be excluded under those guidelines? They could be partially excluded, yes. Partially excluded. Can you explain that? It would depend on the engineering, how they're designed, the impervious, this amount of storage, we can't just blankly say any pervious is this because there's so many differences in it. So we yep. look at their stormwater calculations and we would make, we would work with that applicant on how much would be counted and what would not be counted. Yeah, so basically you're trying to get the hard pack surface there. So asphalt typically and concrete, that's, that's primarily what we see. Other certain pavers may or may not have drainage capability. And there are installations of pervious driveway surfaces that work quite well. And many lake properties around now move to that for those very reasons. So there is a workaround available which could then expand a port surface. Correct. Thank you. Yep. All right. Other questions, comments? We've got a motion and a second to, to uh, close the public hearing at noon on Monday, December 27th and continue the action on this item to our January 4, 2022 City Council meeting. Um, all those in favor of the motion as stated say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried? All right, that concludes our public hearing uh, portion of the agenda. We're gonna move on to reports and recommendations. And we've got some folks with us tonight uh, with respect to a potential approval of the Human Services Task Force report uh, and their funding recommendation for 2022-23. Risi Karim, our city management fellow, has this matter. And with us uh, for the presentation tonight uh, is the chair of the Human Services Task Force, uh, Michael Wood, and then Commissioner Joni Bennett from the Human Rights and Relations Commission is with us as well, our former colleague on the city council. Yeah. Mr. Hello. Mr. Wood, welcome. How are you? My name is Michael Wood and I'm the uh, Human Services Task Force chair. With me is Joni Bennett. And we thought we'd give a peek and kind of the background of how the funding and the process works. Um, this year's task force was made up of five members myself, Joni Bennett, Rachel Pollock, Francesca, and Sabib, who are our student commissioners. The Human Services Funding does have a mission statement. Um, it says that the city of Edina organizations that address an immediate basic human need. And these are elements required for survival of normal health, mental and physical health, such as food, water, shelter, protection from environmental threats and supportive services to assist with activities of daily living. Kind of the history and the background of this funding. The human services funding is a contract for services that a city would or could typically provide. It's authorized by the Minnesota State Constitution and statute. Uh, the funding through this process started in 1977. The funding is a two year cycle and that corresponds with the city budget. Um, with the city council decision, it's advised by the community task force. Kind of the selection process that we use this year is that the city issues a request for or an RFP and that was published on July 30th. The task force reviews the RFP for, uh, submissions. Um, then the task force invites the agencies to interview. The task force formulates its funding recommendations within the budget and then the task force recommended, recommends uh, and submitted to the council for approval. Kind of the timeline for this is what about a six month project. Started June 28th and we re reviewed the history and goals of human services. And then we began work on the request for proposal. Um, July 26th, we approved the request. 
Then on August 23rd, we sent out the um, submissions for the interviews. This year, the interviews were done by Skype or Teams or normally they'd be done in person. Um, October 25th, we, were, um, we proved the report to council and then last month we met with the council with the report. This is, we thought we'd show you typical funding history um, over the last eight, nine years. And these were the organizations that the money was given to. And then this year, we've got the 2022 funding recommendations as listed. And then, as again, this is a two-year funding consideration. Um, the 2023 funding considerations is based on the amounts approved for year one. Um, it's not guaranteed for the second year um, in the event of a budget shortfall. Um, the potential cost of living increases and other city budget items could affect that. And then the 2023 uh, money would be contingent on visit sites where we're actually gonna go out to um, these organizations for the site visit and an audit. So with that, these are the 2022 funding recommendations. All right, good. Does anybody have questions for the chair? Okay, any chair questions for, yes, Member Sutton. I don't have any questions. I just want to thank both of you and the whole committee for your work. It's great work. And and then for the extra two hours, you got to sit here and wait to present it to us tonight. Um, it's all part of the job. <laughs> well, it's really much appreciated and, and it's really important stuff. So thank you for your work on it. Thank you. Yes, Member Jackson. Yeah, I'm just, I, I concur. Thank you so much and for the thorough work that you've done and the excellent work. I could, thought your recommendations were really solid. The work uh, process you went through was really inclusive. A lot to be said about it. And, and as my colleagues have said, we thank you so much for uh, Chair Wood leading the group and then Joni Bennett, uh, we know how committed you are to community. So thanks for being here this evening. And um, so we have a recommendation that the um, let me look at the motion here to approve the funding recommendations as presented by the Human Services Task Force. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Member Jackson moves. Second. Member Staunton seconds the approval of the motion to, uh, or to approve the funding recommendations as presented by the Human Services Task Force this evening. Those various organizations in our, that serve our community. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the, adopting the motion as stated say aye. 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 Opposed? Kerry, thank you for being thank here. You. And th please thank your colleagues as well. All right, now we're on to um, something that Director Milner is covering. It's with the uh, approving the final layout for project one, they call it, of the I-494 corridor vision implementation plan. And Director Milner. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor of the Council, uh, we conducted the public hearing, start, opened it last meeting. Closed it at noon um, on that Monday and received zero comments. So we would recommend a motion to approve resolution 2021-116 for project one of the 494 com commission. Are there questions for Director Milner? All right, is there a motion to approve resolution 2021-116 which should approve the final layout for project one of the I-494 quarter revision implementation plan? So moved. Member Second. Anderson moves. Second. Jackson seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of the motion as stated say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And now we are on to the final two action items of the evening. The first one is the Morningside d &E Neighborhood Roadway Reconstruction Improvement. We had a public hearing a couple weeks ago and um, Director Milner has this matter as well. Director Milner. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. Uh, looking for some direction on our street reconstruction projects here this evening. So Morningside D&E, uh, we opened the public hearing last Monday night, closed it Wednesday at noon of last week. Uh, we received three live comments. 
Uh, four comments on Better Together Edina. We again provided that uh, variety of options for our residents to participate. I think we did a great job there. The comments, we heard support for the Grimes Avenue Bike Boulevard. We answered some assessment questions and had some questions on overhead utilities and construction, real specific construction questions, and we were able to answer those. Uh, we would continue to recommend that Bike Boulevard on Grimes Avenue with pavement markings and signage and staff will look at the guidance and see the size of those markings. I know that was a concern of the council, so we'll continue to review that guidance and make the appropriate things, but we still recommend that facility on Grimes Avenue as supported by the ETC. And we believe the project is necessary to improve the public infrastructure. We'd recommend approving that bike boulevard and if there's any concerns with that, we can approve that at a three to five, three out of five council votes to pass, whereas assessments uh, require four out of five because it was a staff initiated project. So we would uh, recommend approval of resolution number 20, 21-123 with all of staff's recommendations and I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Questions for Director Milner regarding the uh, Morningside project. I noticed in the Better Together uh, postings we had a few concerns, but none about the project itself. It was more, uh, there were more nuanced questions and I'm sure you've answered all of them. Correct. With, you know, trail connections and other things that they were, they were thinking about. So, um, is there a motion to adopt resolution 2021-123 which would approve the Morningside d and &E Neighborhood Roadway Reconstruction Project and approve the Grimes Avenue Bike Boulevard? So moved. Member Jackson moves. Member Staunton seconds. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of the motion as stated say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And then the last uh, action item we have involves the uh, proposed Blake Road neighborhood roadway reconstruction improvement. And we had, uh, I think, a lot of follow on activity from the public hearing and some interested people at the public hearing that were concerned about a variety of different things. And I think some of those concerns resonated both with staff and the council. So Director Milner, go ahead on this matter, please. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, a very nice project to end the year on. So hopefully I can answer some of those concerns and questions as we uh, move towards potential approval. So we received six comments, live testimony on the 13th, and 12 additional on Better Together Edina. Again, we provided those, that variety of options for people to participate and it was taken advantage of. The comments that we heard, protect the mature trees, uh, minimize construction impacts, uh, do we really need that width of a shared use path of eight feet? And then changing that material type of that shared use path from asphalt to concrete. So those are really the summary of those comments that we heard. Um, then there was comments I heard from council. So there's a few things I wanna clarify on retaining walls and the traffic analysis related to the roundabout. So the retaining wall options, I didn't answer this question very good last time. We looked at seven different types of retaining walls. As you can see, the top three on this list are allowed by state aid standards. So recall we need to meet state aid or municipal state aid standards. The bottom four are not allowed because of their proximity to the lake. That middle one, the prefabricated modular block is our typical big block walls that people are very familiar with, but it's not allowed next to a lake. So we can only look at those top three options for this case. So we did look at the sheet pile wall. That's what we're recommending. We had the photo on the left last time. We got a little better photo there on the right hand side with a concrete cap and a fence. And we'll look to where that's appropriate next to some of our pedestrian facilities. I think it's interesting to hear the comments about the aesthetics of, of kind of, a, of this patina or this brownish type uh, sheet pile wall. I don't know if you'll see it too much from the roadway, maybe a few homes across the lake, but we received similar comments on those big block walls that they don't want to see a big white concrete thing. So really the eye of the beholder when I think when you look at aesthetic. So when I look at these walls in both cases, whether it's a big block wall or the sheet pile, what's the safest for the traveling public? What makes sense from a constructability standpoint? What's the long-term maintenance and long-term durability of it? And for those reasons, we again would recommend this style, but I will speak to the other ones just so you're aware of them. The other one is a, is a cast in place concrete. This is a, one of those big white concrete walls if we were gonna do this. It's double the cost. And the reason for that is you have to build a coffer dam in the lake and then pump all the water out of it to basically make the bank dry. And then you also do have to do big tie backs and dig up like the sewer and the water pipes in the street. So just imagine a big, giant excavation to be able to pour a concrete wall. So double the cost, going from three million up to seven. The other potential option would be a, a shoulder 
pile wall where you drive these piles in the ground. You put planks in between the piles, and again, you have to build coffer dams to get the water away from it, and it's just super expensive. This is near $6 million. So again, almost double the cost compared to that recommended sheet pile wall that staff is recommending. We had some questions on the roundabout, and are they appropriate? Is it appropriate in this location, and what are some of the other traffic volumes at, a, at our roundabouts? within the city. So 70th and Valley View Road, this one aligns very well with what we're doing at this intersection. 10,300 cars on that west leg, 9,200 on the east. That's basically exactly what we're looking at with the Blake intersection. 2,700 to the north, real similar to what we're looking at Blake. So roundabouts really allow those, those legs of intersections that are very uneven in traffic volumes and make them, allow them to function really well. Another example of a, offset, of a roundabout with some pretty different dramatic traffic differences here is Valley View Road, Tracy Avenue, and Valley Lane as you go off south of 62 towards the high school. Again, that north-south movement, really high traffic in one direction. Valley Lane always backed up and you couldn't get out of there. Now that operates pretty well in all, all directions. So this is similar to what we want to propose for Blake and uh, Interlochen. One more example, the traffic volumes are pretty similar here on, on Braemar Boulevard down by the golf course. So um, when we get into the actual analysis, so level of service with a traffic analysis. A is good, just like a grade, letter grade in school, and F is bad. That means A through F, you get letter grades based on the amount of delay at an intersection. This graphic here is the existing intersection with that one stop sign on the south leg. You can see there's starting to be some movements that are Fs and Es, so the yellow and the red. The colors are, are basically telling us there's lots of delays. We try to address issues when they get in that D and F range. So today they're experiencing both in the AM peak and the PM peak, um, those delays of an F and an E, and the colors, again, are, are, are not good. We want to address it with this project. So now we had some suggestions of an all-way stop. So we looked at an always stop, what would it look like in 20 years? Because we want to plan for the future. You can see a lot more colors on this, which is bad because we've got a lot more delays. You look at that peak, PM peak for an always stop, we're getting up there in quite a bit of delay. Even the AM peak, we're getting Ds in there that we didn't see even with existing conditions. So I would not recommend an always stop in any, any manner here at this intersection. A traffic signal, we did look at a traffic signal. It, you can see no colors. It operates very well. It, it'll do the job uh, to tell traffic when to go and get them through the intersection in a very efficient manner in both the AM and the PM peak in the 2041 conditions. And then the roundabout does the best, the least amount of delay of any of the options we looked at. Um, so if I just looked at traffic pieces, you know, the roundabout's slightly better than a traffic signal. And I'll speak to why I still recommend the roundabout in this case. We did have some questions about the, the turning templates of trucks and buses. So we purposely designed this left or right hand graphic is of a bus. You can see the little vehicle here, that's a, a bus. The green lines are it driving north and they, it leaves the tracks of the cars. So this thing is designed with a 90 foot radius from um, the splitter islands. That means a bus can make it without driving over the center of that thing. And that's very important for us so buses can make this turn without having to drive over that surmountable curb. Garbage truck, very similar turning templates as a school bus. On the left hand side is a bigger truck. And again, we have very limited numbers of trucks that go through here, but we do have moving, moving trucks, the semi trailers. And in that case, they would come through and the trailer and the tractor would go over the center of that thing. So that goes to one of the points about a resident wanting to have a, some kind of rock or structure or some kind of thing in the middle it would get run over. It would not be able to work with a, with a tractor trailer, even in the limited amounts that go through here. So there is a potential option. If the council wants to kind of beautify the roundabout, we could do colored or stamped concrete. We could do um, a big kind of manhole with some kind of logo on there. So there's things we can do at the level of the concrete, but nothing that's vertical, because it, it would get hit. So again, why am I recommending a roundabout? It actually uses less space than a traffic signal. We would need right turn lane or turn lanes with a traffic signal, and I have to ask those property owners on the north for more easements. So we've gotten slivers just to do the roundabout, so it actually the roundabout takes less space than a traffic signal, and it's less expensive than, than having a traffic signal down there because of all the equipment. It's traffic calming with those longer curvilinear splitter islands and the narrower lanes, 
and it really improves that pedestrian experience all the time, not just when the traffic signal is red in a certain direction. So that roundabout really creates that traffic calming that provides opportunities for pedestrians to cross the street. There's those refuge, refuge islands as they do those movements. And then the pedestrians with those islands only need to cross one uh, direction of traffic at a time versus cross, crossing them all at a traffic signal. So we would recommend uh, approving the roundabout uh, with the sheet pile retaining wall. We would recommend approving that eight foot wide shared use path. And the reason I'm recommending that is this is really a life cycle decision. This is our opportunity once in about every 50 years to, to put in a facility that we feel will meet the needs today and in the future for our bikes and peds facility. I'd look to the council to share their thoughts on the, on the material, whether we do concrete or asphalt. I've shared that we can afford to do the concrete here. We've heard a lot of comments about concrete. I'd be more than happy to do that if council feels that's appropriate. What we've already done with the typical section is narrowed down the on-street bike lanes from six feet down to five feet. So we've already decided with the comments we've heard as a staff to just shrink the width of those two bike lanes by a foot each. So we just gained two feet to help protect those trees. And I'd like to use that feet to continue to use that eight foot wide shared use path because I think that's very important to have more space for those individuals that are not comfortable on the roadway. And then I'll share with you that I'll continue to work with those residents to protect those trees as we get in the final design. If needed, we'll bring in the city forester with our designs. And if he thinks there's a tree that's really gonna be impacted from a health concern, we would consider narrowing that shared use path maybe right at the tree or through a couple trees. So if we recommend and approve an eight foot wide and the city forester says you should go to seven, maybe six, I'd be comfortable making that shrink by the tree and then widening it out again where appropriate and maybe doing it another tree down the way. So we could work with the forester and, and make those adjustments um, narrowing next to the trees. So I believe it's, uh, this project's necessary to improve the public infrastructure. Again, if the shared use path is an issue of many members, we can approve that with only three votes, but the assessments need a four out of five council votes to pass and the assessments are really for that street reconstruction portion of the project. So I would recommend approval of that resolution 2021-122 with those amendments that I just noted on that previous slide and I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Uh, Member Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Director Milner, can you pull up from the December 13th presentation that I think slide 12 talked about the um, share path and then I think I understand there it is this one yeah and so here what what you're saying is both the bike lanes are five feet well you know just explain what the recommendation is yep so what staff has done to start to address those concerns with the trees and what we heard from the residents is We've made a conscious effort to, to tweak, to adjust the typical section. So I'm recommending a five foot on street bike lane, five foot on this side. So that gains us two additional feet to really hug that Eastern curb line because the road wasn't centered. And then that gives us two additional feet over here to protect the trees. So then I would recommend that you approve the eight foot shared use, but then I'll continue to work during the final design. If we get some potential concerns with trees, then we'll mm -hmm. reach out to our city forester. And if he says, you know what, another foot or two would really be beneficial to this specific tree, mm -hmm. then I would narrow that uh, facility to seven feet and maybe six feet, depending on kind of the opinion of the city forester. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I do think we have seen a lot of uh, feedback in support of this. Um, during the, the public testimony, uh, I, I love it when residents acknowledge benefit to what's, what we're doing. Um, and I would say there, there are two things that um, I jotted down as concerns. One was this one. Um, and for me, I, I would like to see the shared use path not be eight feet. And so I, you know, I, I understand um, why in the plan it's eight feet, um, but to reduce that 
uh, you know, an additional foot from what you're recommending so that it's, you know, maybe seven feet um, with the purpose of, again, just minimizing impact to the trees. Um, and then I do like the idea of, of adjusting that where we need to. Um, and so in other areas, maybe it is eight feet, uh, but where we need to, as you're suggesting, um, I would recommend we shrink that um, so that we can, we can do even more to protect the, the trees there. Um, and the other thing I would add here, uh, I, when I am walking on a shared use path, my behavior doesn't change. And so if I sense a, a cycle behind me, I move over, even if, even if it's eight feet. I, I just, so I struggle to understand um, why we need such a wide shared use path when we're talking about um, an ability to protect the trees and you know, more um, green space. Um, because I think it's rare that we would have, you know, two people walking, someone walking a dog, a stroller, and then a cycle all on the shared path at the same time um, in unison, right? I just think that that's rare. Um, and so I would try to value, um, I would try to weigh protection of the green space and not build the shared path for all scenarios, right? And so if there's a little bit of discomfort here or there, um, I think I would value having it smaller so that we can protect the green space um, in this case. And so I do appreciate, and you said this on the 13th, that you would look at reducing the, the bike lane um, as well. So that's, that's one of the, that's one bit of feedback that I would like to see us do. Um, do you have a response to that? I just support eight feet because you get a stroller, even one stroller and two people walking, you're already yeah. at four or five feet and there's not a lot of room for um, additional users. Because when you look at eight feet is right at the back of curb, so you don't even have that buffer, right? You don't want to walk right on that six inch lip that you could fall off of. Yeah. So, And I'm just thinking of all users, right? Is it a person with some mobility issues, like you're, you can get out of the way. Some people can't get out of the way, right? Sure. So if a bike's coming and they can't go that quickly uh, and the biker doesn't acknowledge that person and then we wanna just have enough space for all users. So yeah. appreciate your comments, thank you. Yeah, I, um, and so it, I, I, it makes me think about um, not trying to necessarily use um, signage and structure to uh, mitigate behavior as well. Um, and so I understand the point, uh, but like I mentioned, um, I do think it's an important point that we wanna have a path that everybody can use. Um, but, I, but if we can adjust that path where it's gonna benefit more green space um, is, is what my preference would be there. And then the second, um, comment that we heard a lot about was the assessment. Um, and I don't, yeah, I don't know how to, to um, address that. Um, I do believe that um, this, this particular project is gonna provide a lot of benefit to the community. Um, and I, you know, last time I raised my hand, cause I do, I've cycled by there, I've walked through there. Um, and I'm excited about the idea of being able to do that in a more safe manner down um, through this, this intersection um, on into um, down Interlocking Boulevard. Um, but that is one that I, I, you know, I still struggle with how to answer that um, other than you know, thanking those residents for <laughs> their assessment because we do see that across the entire city uh, to a certain extent, right? We're extending benefit um, that our entire community will, will benefit from. Uh, but I do wanna acknowledge 
uh, that that is, uh, that is a, a tough one to be able to uh, um, articulate sometimes. Member Sutton. Can you remind me, is the path um, north of Spruce on, in, into Hopkins concrete? Correct. Okay. So I'm, I'm sympathetic to matching that and using concrete instead of the bituminous. Okay. Um, it's kind of the we, it's reminiscent of our 58th Street discussion, and I get it that, I mean, I understand that we're talking on the one hand about, um, about a smoother ride if you're on an asphalt, but then over time and the look and the appearance, and I, so I'm sympathetic to the neighbors who want to do that. I like your, your idea of trying to be sensitive to particular trees and going out of our way to try and shrink that down where we need to to preserve those trees. Um, I did get a question that you answered in an email about why we're doing this shared path when it's not part of the comprehensive plan or the master bike plan. And you want to just repeat what you shared with me on that? Yeah, I mean, those are guiding documents. They're kind of the guide. And then we look at the specific context of every project and we see if there's factors that maybe trigger us to think about maybe we should do a little bit more here. So when we thought about this Blake Road corridor, about the number of users, uh, the number of cyclists and where they're going with the twin loops coming through here, with the new light rail station in Hopkins, and that Hopkins already has an eight foot wide concrete thing, we want to be consistent through the corridor. So. That's why we're recommending that it goes down through the land bridge at a wider facility, and then people can disperse from there throughout the other kind of more neighborhood streets. Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And the, and the light rail station, which will be up, what, at Blake mm -hmm. Road and, and Excelsior? Just north of there, Just correct. north of there. So yeah. that's, that's an important factor, and um, so I do think it's important to add that. I also, you know, having lived near this area, this is a notorious corner, and so I'm a big fan of the roundabout. It may seem like overkill to some folks, but I really think it's going to be in a big improvement. And the, the shared use path allows pedestrians to kind of get around the area, whereas right now you just don't even dare go out there if you're member Pierce exempted. His courage is above and beyond. but. But biking through there or walking through there is pretty treacherous, and so this will really help that. And then I'm sensitive to the, um, to the amount of the assessment. I know that's not what we're talking about here. The assessment hearing will follow, but, but um, I also, you also provided me with some comparables on 58th Street as well as um, Tracy, which are other MSA routes. And it looks like this is less than some of those, but more than others, kind of in that same range. What was it? 9,600 for 58th Street, 7,300 for 62nd Street, and 5,200 for Tracy Avenue. And the 5,200 at Tracy was back in 2016, so that's five years ago already. Yeah, and then every project's got its own density of properties, yeah. projects that have come. So, I mean, those numbers are you gotta take them with a little grain of salt on what is the context of those particular projects. Sure. But from an MSA standpoint, this fits right in with other, and those are the old policy, right? So right. this one is cheaper than, than two of those. Yeah. And I would anticipate that because we're removing all retaining walls and all subcuts and lowering that assessment from that 20% number that's in those to 14 or 15 we talked about last time. So, right. um, and then I wanted to clarify, we are hoping you'll set preliminary assessments tonight. It's not the final assessment hearing. Right, and we'll do yeah. that once the project's done. Exactly. And you have a very good track record of not exceeding that and, in fact, being conservative on these things. And so I've appreciated that over the years. So, so I'm, I'm, uh, I think this is a good plan. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, Member Anderson. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, could you go back to that last slide, oh. please, Director Miller? Thank you. It, it's when I see it and I, I, I pay attention to our conversation tonight, it, it reminds me a little bit of the 58th Street conversation and trying to find the, the right balance about what should or shouldn't be. I'm wondering, um, following Member Pierce's tree concerns and those, that discussion, 
it, it, when, and you've mentioned, well, if we found a foot over here, maybe we could find here and we could move it to seven or if necessary, six. Is there any data that, that instructs us as to how much room really makes difference with the trees? It's, it's, a, it's a feel, right? It's a city forester's experience with construction. You know, I've been doing this for 20 years of construction. Typically trees don't grow out to the, to the street, so we don't see a lot of roots there, but he also provided the city forester a new technique where we can high pressure air, all the roots, mm -hmm. uh, make them visible, get all the soil blown away, and then you look at the root system. It might be a health hazard already because they might be balling up next to the street. We can make some improvements doing that technique on some of these trees. So we might have a plan to go out for bids, and then we're gonna have another plan during construction to look at some of the, maybe we identify three that are still on that borderline. Let's get this technique out there. Let's, let's expose the roots and really see what we have, and then work with the city forester or some other arborist to determine what is the proper way to go. But I wouldn't go any less than six feet. That's our minimum just from a snow plowing standpoint, and and uh, walkability when it's right on the back of curb. So we have roughly two feet additional. So that's almost four feet difference than what I was talking about last time I was here. So. Yes. Um, and as you mentioned, there's really no boulevard here. There so, is no boulevard. So, I mean, the, the margin of error becomes very thin. Yep. Um, okay. Well, good. That answers my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Member Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I think most of my questions have been answered. There was a question of the customized um, retaining wall at, right there at Spruce and, and Blake. Mm -hmm. That's going to be protected, right? I think that you presented that the last yep. time. I just wanted to yep. refresh my memory. Um, so I you know, echo a lot of the things that uh, Member Staunton said. I don't need to repeat it. I do favor the concrete. Um, I walked up there, and you know, it, it's parallel with what Hopkins has. I'm really pleased to see those extra two feet that you found. Thank you for doing that. Sure. Um, uh, you also provided us, I think it was you, um, the assessments from some of our other street uh, mm -hmm. programs. So I know it's a little confusing with the MSA, but when we look at Melody Lake and some of the other projects, this is considerably less per home than some of those projects. So I think the it's $7,000, correct? Approximately, correct. yeah. I, th I think that's in line with what we've asked other people to pay for their streets. Correct. Um, so those are my comments. Yes, on the concrete. Um, thank you for all the protection of the trees. Um, I really appreciate that, and, and I know that you will um, be in contact with the forester and 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 do and the neighbors um, trying to protect that. And found us a, a bunch of feet already. So uh, thank you. I, I like this project. Thank you, Director Milner. Um, I think one of the questions that uh, Councilmember Pierce asked was. Essentially, why you're recommending an eight foot wide shared use path. We've got an eight foot wide path coming down from Hopkins. We used eight feet on 58th Street for a shared pathway, which incidentally is getting really strong support from the neighborhood after the fact. So we feel like we made good decisions over there. Uh, is it an engineering standard or recommendation with respect to non motorized movements when you have a shared path to be at eight feet? Yeah, if you think you're going to have, um, you know, multiple different types of users, walkers, bikers, strollers, dogs, they recommend eight feet. It can be down to six feet, but the kind of that standard is eight feet. All right. You know, what this project reminds me the most of is the project that we did over on Valley View by the golf course where you had a, a brief illustration of the diagram we put in mm -hmm. the roundabout. And then uh, that portion of Valley View that ran from the roundabout over to Macaulay Trail, yep. and then up Valley View towards the high school, uh, that whole neighborhood has just been transformed by what we did over there. Because before, it was just like a pass-through neighborhood. It has that same sort of feeling that, that, it had that same sort of feeling that Blake Road has to me now, where you feel like you're passing through that area to get from one point to another. And I think, what we're going to see is an unbelievable beautification of that portion of Blake Road, which all these neighbors deserve. I think they'll be, when it's all said and done, they'll be re they'll really be excited about it. And it'll be a transformation, just like it was over on Valley View. I only wish that with respect to the roundabout, we had the kind of room we had on the roundabout uh, on Valley View by the golf course where we were able to put plantings in there. Yep. So um, I'm joining Member Jackson and Member Anderson didn't comment on it, but I think the concrete is the best way to go on the pathway. I'm comfortable at eight feet. 
And I, I'd go, I'd recommend that we go with colored or stamped concrete on the island to try to, to make it a little bit more attractive okay. some way, somehow. Um, but I'm going to be supportive of this. The, you know, the assessment, it's never any fun to do an assessment, even if 80% uh, of the money for a project uh, is coming out of the state aid funds and they're only paying 20%, that 20% still smarts a little bit, uh, even at the projected level of over 7,000. But it's going to be a, a, a wonderful transformation, as I said, of the neighborhood, in my opinion. So I'm going to support it as well. Um, now, Member Pierce, one thing we could do, if you have trouble with that eight-foot shared pathway idea, we can break this into two parts. We could, we could have a motion on the resolution that would approve the neighborhood roadway reconstruction and then take on the eight-foot shared use pathway width and the five-foot bike lane separately, if, that, if that's something that's important to you. Um, yeah, so let, let me make a couple comments um, first. Um, I did not say anything about concrete, so I agree with my colleagues on the okay. concrete, so I missed that piece. Um, from a, a design perspective, um, where I'm going is I, I don't think we should always design for the worst case. And I actually don't think that's what you're suggesting. Um, uh, and so one thing I'd like for you to do is to just, can you just restate uh, the approach that you're gonna recommend um, in tweaking um, as we move forward uh, with, the, yeah. with the path, yeah. Council Member Pierce, so as I stated here on this one, we're going to narrow the on-street, the on-street bite lanes from six feet to five feet. So that gives us two additional feet for tree protection. We're still gonna hold the east side of the road and try to move it as close to those power poles as we can, maybe mm -hmm. gain a little bit on that side. So we gain two feet in the street and then I would still recommend that eight foot wide, consistent down past the curve. Once we hit the lake, we wanna widen that up a little bit. But that section basically just south of Waterman oh, up Waterman. to Hopkins, yeah. if there's trees that are of issue, we'll do a first run of our design. Then we'll meet with our city forester and say we're within X feet or we need a little retaining wall. We know we need some walls on a few of those trees. Yeah. And see what his opinion is and meet with the residents and start having conversations is we're gonna be like right here, resident, you have a concern, forester, and if they do, then we'll shrink it another foot or two up to that six foot. Yeah. So really, I know there's like five or six key trees that have been treated for 30 years. You know, there's an oak and some elms. We wanna mm -hmm. definitely make sure those uh, survive give them the best chance of survival. And then we'll also use that root cleaning technique yep. during construction to again review what we're, maybe during design we say eight feet's fine. We get out there and we see all the roots and you know, city force says, no, nah, you better go to six and do this. So we'll do that during construction. Yep. So it's continuing to work with the residents, the city forester in the final design and during construction. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and so I, the comment I would make, I think that you have, um, you and your staff have developed a reputation with the residents that you do listen um, and you do, you essentially do what you say you're going to do. Um, and so I think, I, I certainly appreciate that and I think the residents appreciate that. I came in tonight um, expecting that I would not vote for this uh, specifically for the eight foot shared path. The project in totality, um, I do agree with it, and I think I've, I've shared that. My concern was just the, uh, the eight feet wide path. And so my question um, with that backdrop, how, 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 how do we assure the residents of the process that you just described? Um, because once we once we move forward um, with the the current design, um, it doesn't come. Does it come back here? It comes back. If it we'll adjusts. open bids in in March, yep. and you'll award a contract. Oh no, no no! I mean, when you look at where you may need to adjust the path. Oh well, we we could bring that back as part of the award, or at a different yep. time, and just provide an update, or we could provide a one-page memo of these. We already, I already have the address. So I know exactly which yeah, six addresses. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> we could just do a project update yeah. just on the consent or 
you know, some other method. Yeah, but, but it's not likely the project would stop. I mean, I think no. that's no. I think that's what you're asking, Council Member. I, I don't want to stop the project. That's what so I'm let me be yeah. clear about that. Yeah. Um, but I think it would. I think it um, would be. Um, I think I would want to be able to see that final design so that we can. Or you have a chance to talk about these are the trees that we saw. We've done this process. We. We've noticed that in these areas, we do need to shrink the path. Yeah. And so here's what we're going to do. Um, I just think it's it's a, a great opportunity uh, for you and your staff to be able to talk about the engagement that you're doing with the community. And I think that would continue to keep them engaged um, as you go forward with the project, rather than just saying, we're just going to do eight feet, right? And so that's, that's where I'm going with that. Um, I don't know how to put that in a motion, but, but that's that's where I'm going with it. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know if it fits exactly within the context of a motion, but I think it does. You know, you've given verbal direction. I think the uh, I think all of us feel the same. You can see that staff recommendation that says if needed, based on city yeah. forester option yeah. about tree health, we'll consider narrowing the shared use path. And um, I'm expecting that Director Milner, as you say, is a man of his word, and he'll come back and tell us if there's an issue, and and um, we can deal with it. But otherwise, it would probably be something that gets dealt with in the course of construction. And that that's what I was going to suggest as well. I mean, this is this is all on TV now, right? So, <laughs> so our our commitments that we're making to you are really important to our personal credibility, our professional credibility. So, I think that's something you can count on as well. And I, I would add, um, not just to the profession, professional credibility of the staff, but of council. So we all heard those uh, desires. And I think the approach uh, that you described is a very iterative process that should yield a good result. And it's a good balance between the two. And so I just want to ensure that as we go through that work, um, that we are able to um, more or less just showcase that process and, and honoring what some of the neighbors have asked for. And, and that's I, it. Yeah, I think we're going to have some good discussions. We're going to have uh, everything, you know, nothing's 100%, right? There still might be uh, a tree that we just can't do it, and then we have to work with the resident to what's the replacement. So we're going to use all these techniques and see what we can do. And even a year or two after, typically if something happens, Two years after a project, we still work with the resident on that thing. So we do everything we can, and sometimes um, there's other circumstances that may affect the tree. So we'll do everything, but there's no guarantees with trees when when you have a project like this. So, no, no thank you. So, Member uh, Pierce, I just thought of something here that we could potentially do. Um, so, if I look at the language of the proposed motion, I'm looking towards the end. It says. Um, uh, the eight-foot shared use path width to accommodate both pedestrians and bicyclists of all ages and abilities north of Waterman Avenue. We could add potentially language with a narrowing of the shared use path in locations where the city forester thinks a narrowing is appropriate. Yeah, as appropriate. Yeah, as appropriate. That, that's yeah. something that you'd be comfortable with? Yeah. Okay. Because that's who we're going to rely on at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah, I think that, that's the spirit of it, yeah. Okay, yep. I, I wouldn't make that motion. All right, all right. Uh, so Member Pierce is moving to adopt Resolution 2021-122, which is approve the Blake Road Neighborhood Roadway Reconstruction Project and approving the eight-foot shared use path width to accommodate both pedestrians and bicyclists of all ages and abilities north of Waterman Avenue with a narrowing of the shared use path in locations where the city forester deems appropriate. Make sense? So moved. Yeah. All right, is there a second? Second. All right, got a motion by Member Pierce, second by Member Jackson. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion of stated say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I don't think we've had any correspondence come in. Kirk Allison, you haven't had anything come in? No? Okay. And then uh, I don't have an aviation noise update. Manager Neal, nothing. Mayor and Council comments, uh, let's mix it up a little bit tonight and start with uh, Member Anderson. Well, thank you, Your Honor. Um, it's uh, tonight's the winter solstice, today. 
longest, uh, shortest day of the year. It won't be our shortest meeting of the year, um, quite. Um, but I, you know, it's a, it's. I, I just want to mention that the the is the year has gone by, and this has been a year of transition, really. We've gone from uh, virtual meetings with occasional uh, breakdowns in technology, basically by yours truly, um, and occasionally others, to um, uh, opening up uh, this chamber to good discussions, good decisions. Um, and I, I truly appreciate the level of professionalism and uh, the collegial atmosphere that we have here. It's, it's really not important, I don't think. In fact, I, it, it, that we agree on everything. In fact, I think it's important that we don't agree on everything. I think that the level of debate and the level of consideration serves the public well. So I want to thank all of you and staff for that and for that opportunity. Thank you. Um, I, I, I do want to mention uh, as well that uh, there was uh, a young Edina resident, a 15-year-old. Her name is Sydney Rayleigh who, uh, she's a McDonald's employee in Eden Prairie, and uh, she saved over the weekend a customer's life. Uh, she had been trained in the Heimlich Maneuver about two years ago and um, noticed that a customer, she was working the drive through window, noticed that the customer was choking, went through the window, uh, uh, applied the Heimlich Maneuver with the aid of another uh, uh, individual on site and saved that woman's life. It's, um, it's notable and remarkable, and I, I will probably have an opportunity to recognize that at some future date, but um, it was very recent. And uh, so good job, Sydney. You're probably not watching, but if you are, then um, I, I, I thank you for your effort, and I know that you uh, have a fan for the rest of your life of the person that you saved. Um, Along those lines, we should, we should designate her a hometown hero. And absolutely, we'll, we'll talk to Director Benerod about that. that we heard yep. that story as well. I think it's, you're on a great idea there. Yeah, and and, and possibly uh, in that same thought, uh, and and moving uh, to uh, the thing I'm really most concerned about these days uh, is uh, the three uh, Samaritans, the Good Samaritans, I would say, who intervened. Um, at the, uh, during a carjacking attempt uh, some time ago, a few days ago, uh, over at uh, Byerly's, or uh, Lunds, on 50th and France. Um, their efforts uh, probably saved uh, a great deal of pain uh, and uh, for the victim there. We've seen her interviewed uh, on television, I think now national television. Her testimony, as well as others at a meeting that uh, started as a neighborhood meeting, expanded to a community meeting uh, that uh, uh, the other night at Edina Country Club was very moving. And th the, the tension, the emotional outpour in that room was visceral, it was meaningful, and I know that those in attendance took it seriously. Um, and. Uh, Followed, uh, that, that meeting was followed by two meetings two that occurred here yesterday. And um, again, uh, the recognition of a crime spike in our, in our community is important. Um, and I, I, I want to recognize also the mayor uh, for being involved in uh, the community meeting. I know it was a six city meeting. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the date. It was in the last week or so with the, uh, the respective police chiefs of those six cities and the city managers. And I know that of that group, Mr. Mayor, that uh, if that group decides to present a united front, they will be heard without question. So I commend you on that. Thank you, no, for, thank you. for taking that action. Um, and, and also, I, I think a reflection of in that room and, and in two meetings here yesterday, uh, there was a great deal of appreciation uh, and, I think, pride in our police force. Uh, and so thank you for that, uh, for your quick response. I think that um, I'm especially appreciative of just straight talk from, from your new department chief, uh, Chief Melbourne. 
uh, he, I believe, has responded to what I view as a local crisis in a very professional way. That guy landed here about four months ago and now has taken this on and I think managed it well so far and he's, he's doing a great job. Um, I had a, a text at six o'clock this morning uh, from somebody saying their car had been stolen the night before over on Parkwood Road. And so we, we just have to recognize, I think, that this is gonna be ongoing regardless of the efforts of, of our police force, which are exemplary. And, and I, I know that this council is very committed to supporting our police force and recognizing the issues that we face. And I know that we, we go beyond empathy with those affected by it. Um, increasingly, I find, though, that the public directs its attention to the criminal justice system and, and ultimately wonders whether it's lost its thread. There are victimizations that are occurring in our community and so it becomes apparent, and, and I base that on the comments of, of Senator Franzen and Representative Edelson who were, uh, uh, who attended all three of the meetings I mentioned and their attendance and, and support is appreciated. Um, but there, there have to be actions taken on several levels as they mentioned, legislatively and also on a county prosecution level. Um, because the, the, the pace, I, what, what I read from, uh, from uh, Chief Milburn's presentation yesterday is that we've had 21 occurrences in, in a month recorded. Now, possibly that's tapered off a little bit, but I, I don't know to what extent. Um, it's unacceptable, and, and, and it, it has to be. We can't, we have to continue to take it seriously. I feel confident that this council is uh, of a similar mind as it relates to the support of the police department and concern for the victims of crime in our town. And so I'm hoping, I trust, that we can find a way to draft a resolution to be sent to elected and appointed officials on the state and county level, urging a timely response to uh, our, our issue uh, and, um, and suggesting necessary change in law enforcement to begin to bring this activity to a halt. I think that, will, that, that can be a function that we embrace. At, at 21 reported crimes in a one month period, that means that if we wait four months before substantive action is taken, we begin to bring a change to this that can be 84 more victims. That's not acceptable. It's not okay. So um, again, I appreciate all of you. I appreciate the staff. I appreciate what's being done. And I thank you for your time. Happy New Year. Yeah, thank you, Member Anderson, for those comments. We're very, very well done. Um, Member Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, today, as Member Anderson pointed out, is a solstice and it's gonna get brighter from here. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. In the, since we last met, four people have died of COVID-19 in our city. And we're at, at a sort of a grim number of 99 deaths. And I think COVID has continued to affect us in many ways. And I think that's a big part of what's happening with um, some of this crime that's happening is people have just lost their way, they've lost their patience, and they've lost their civility. Um, Public safety is, is a really important part of our city. And uh, so I've, I've got a couple of thoughts. One is just, I, I wanna acknowledge that COVID's been hard on everybody and it's not over yet. Uh, we'll get there. Uh, but I just think that uh, it's good to remember um, patience. And I want to say a little bit more about that, but first I wanna, um, I lost my train of thought. Uh, well, let me just talk about that. I want to thank the staff for all the special things that they've done in the last two years to respond to this pandemic. You know, we've got the police that are, are dealing with an uptick in crime. We've had our communication staff have to put on online meetings for not just us, but for all the commissions and, and to keep the people informed about where we are with this pandemic. We've had park staff come up with special programs uh, when we weren't be able to get together. And I know the human resources department has had to work with this great resignation, um, trying to make sure that our city continues to run and, and that they're working very hard to do that. And just a lot of unsung heroes. And I want to acknowledge 
all the special efforts because this has been hard. It has been stressful. stressful. We've all been asked to do extraordinary things. And I want to acknowledge that and thank everybody who works for the city and everybody in the city who's been patient um, in, in trying to address this pandemic. It's, it's difficult. Uh, when we're talking about public safety, I was thinking, you know, public safety is more than police. Public safety is also snow plowing. Public safety is clean water and sewer services. And so much, you know, we put a lot of money into our police department and our fire department, and it is, is justified. I think we have probably the best trained and, and most reliable police service in the, in the state. I, I'm really confident in the work and, and with our firefighters as well. But I also want to acknowledge the public service and public safety aspect of the other things that we do. Um, you know, if the police can't get to your house because there's snow, that's a public safety problem. If the firemen can't get there to put out the fire because of snow or because of poor pavement, that's a problem. So I, I want to acknowledge that public safety really is job one with us. And I'm very proud of the job that we do, but it's also a, it's a personal commitment of mine. And I know of, of, of a lot of what we do. And it's number one. Um, so with that, I want to echo what the chief said. If you see something, say something, call 911 immediately. If you need to shout, yell, honk your horn, it works. Lock your doors, take your key fobs out of your cars. Everybody needs to do their part. It sounds small, it's big. Uh, we're all in this together. Public safety is important and um, happy solstice. And to everybody, have a very happy new year. Thank you. Thank you, Member Jackson. Member Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I um, just a, a few comments um, just to pick up off of Men Member Anderson. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate is that um, the last council meeting, I raised concerns about racial profiling. Um, and there were a number of residents in the community that reached out um, and were concerned. Um, and I just want to be clear, everyone agreed that the crime has to stop. And so I want to make this statement. I support the resolution um, idea that member Anderson raised. However, it has to be done in a way that keeps us all together. Um, and I can't express enough to you how important it is for when our chief at the last meeting, um, when a member raised an issue, for the chief to say he's from a community, he's actually used to being in a community that is far more diverse than Edina. And I have talked to police officers, uh, up to our police officers, and I know that several of them take that to heart as well. Um, but it is very important uh, and very meaningful for someone other than the ones that are concerned to speak up. And I feel, I feel like he spoke up uh, on behalf of those that are concerned. And not only that, but Representative Franzen and Ellison, um, they both did the same thing. Um, and so I think it is, I, I want to just, you know, thank um, um, those that pulled together those, the events where we talked about policing and safety and to recognize uh, members of the council for reaching out and saying, hey, I'm concerned about that too, what can we do? And Chief Milburn sent me an email asking what I could do to help, the, to help him and his staff understand that issue a little bit more personally. And again, that, that speaks volumes. Um, and so I, I, would, uh, I would encourage us to think about the pillars of the city. We are better together. Um, and as, as much as we can, we have to make sure that we make it through um, these types of challenges, but we do it all together. 
um, as we go into 2022, uh, one of the things that I would, um, would ask um, is that we not let a few voices who may not subscribe to what I just said be the loudest voices in the room. Um, I think it's incumbent on all of us who believe that we are better together to speak out and hold um, each other accountable for that. Um, this, I think this, you know, this is the last meeting of the first year of my uh, first term <laughs> as uh, city council. And um, I'm appreciative of all of the community support, appreciative of the support of uh, my fellow colleagues here, um, as well as the staff. I have um, enjoyed this first year and I look forward to more. So thank you. Thank you, Member Pierce. Member Sutton? I cannot add anything to what my three colleagues have said, so I'm going to leave it there. Thank you, and Happy New Year, and Happy Holidays to everybody. Good. Thank you, Member Sutton. I was thinking about um, some of the things we've been doing over the past uh, couple of weeks since we had that incident of an attempted carjacking at Lunds, and uh, folks have covered it, I think, really well. But I, I do think, uh, to follow on with Member Jackson at one point, that when we had this meeting uh, put, it, put together by a neighborhood uh, last Wednesday at the Adana Country Club with over 300 people present, and I want to say residents of Edina, but there were people there from Minneapolis and Plymouth, and it, you had the sense from listening to people in the audience when it came time to ask Chief Milburn questions that they had just been craving a place to talk about what had happened to them or what had happened in their neighborhood and had so many things that they, they needed to be able to express. And so to be able to provide an environment for that or a location for that in Edina was something I never expected to appreciate, but I was really uh, grateful that our town and one of our neighborhoods stepped up, but it became a platform for so many other people and other communities to be able to express their concerns as well. And um, that was quickly followed by uh, Scott Neal and our chief determining that we needed to have a couple of town talks you know, that uh, there was standing room only at uh, the United Country Club because they had a, a big room that we could meet in. Um, and then we've had these two town talks where the chief has done, I think, a tremendous job, as um, Council Member Pierce has pointed out, in, in talking to the audience about, in some cases, questions that are very difficult to deal with. Um, and I'm really grateful that you, Manager Neal, chose to hire him after 30 years uh, experience, or near 30 years experience in a town, as Member Pierce said, is far more diverse than Edina. To have those kinds of experiences and bring that to our community along with those communication skills that he has. Uh, and just his earnestness as a person is really beneficial to our community. Um, and so what are, what are we doing? I mean, Manager Neal and our chief met last Friday with um, five other communities, uh, Plymouth, Minnetonka, Edina, Eden Prairie, Bloomington, St. Louis Park. And uh, we had a press release out of that talking about how we were going to be working together to Member Anderson's point. Um, I followed that on with an with a email to the governor's chief of staff because I thought it would be important for mayors to be able to meet with the governor to express what I was hearing from mayors calling from all over the metro that uh, Edina was taking the lead on something. and. And we were hearing from people that they were having the same sorts of challenges that we were having, whether it was um, Inver Grove or Maple Grove or it was um, Lake Elmo, uh, all the way out to Corcoran. So we scheduled on uh, regular regional council of mayors meetings on the 10th of January. And I've asked uh, Karen Dewar, our executive director, to broaden that invitation list out uh, through the League of Minnesota Cities to any mayor that wants to come that's in the metro. I think we'll try to do it in a hybrid fashion so mayors from greater Minnesota can participate as well because we've been hearing from them too. Um, I talked to Mayor Fry yesterday for a while um, about how we could help each other and work together. 
on these issues. Uh, had that conversation on that Wednesday morning of the event with at Edana Country Club with County Attorney Mike Freeman, who at that point had pledged then the uh, appointment of those special prosecutors to deal with this type of auto-related uh, criminality on both a juvenile and an adult basis. And they're already at work with two of the three suspects that we've been able to arrest along with St. Louis Park. And um, it looks like they're gonna be, because of the violence involved, able to um, be prosecuted, or they're being requested to be prosecuted as adults. I don't know where we are in the exact process, but this is all about conduct. And, that's what, and, and to the extent there are kids involved in this, I know when I talked to Mayor Fry, he said uh, we got so many uh, young people involved in this activity. Uh, to the extent that the system isn't serving them well, or they need help some way, somehow, to have a to, uh, to be able to live life the way life's meant to be lived, as I've mentioned before, we got to we got to help them too. But let's get the crime tamped down first. That's first and foremost. Uh, I, when this whole thing started, I harkened back to. Um, uh, reading a book about uh, George Washington's farewell address, and it was two simple messages that he had was protect the nation, keep it safe, and let the people uh, be safe in their person and property so that the, the country can prosper. And unless people are feeling safe in their person and property, and we know it from all the emails we got, how quickly people became fearful for themselves and their families, it eventually has that effect of affecting productivity and prosperity gets affected. So. Uh, there's a lot of tentacles to this uh, to this uh, criminal activity that will be that we will benefit from in terms of tamping it down. Um, so public safety needs all of us, as Member Jackson pointed out. It needs uh, an effective police department, but it needs us with our all of our collective eyes on the street to help them too. So I think going forward, um, I'm going to keep working as hard as I can with mayors around the region. I'm going to try to get the governor engaged, although I heard today that he's got COVID. So we'll see where that goes. And then Mayor Fry, and then uh, to the extent Mayor Carter wants to be involved, we'll be visiting with him as well. And so we'll keep working on this. I know our, our police will be doing an effective job, and um, we'll, we'll make sure. We've been through a lot together, I guess is the way to put it, the last two years. <laughs> Through, um, through COVID, COVID phase two, civil unrest to the neighboring community, uh, we're gonna get through this too. Um, we got a strong and resilient crew of people in our town and, and we'll make it through this. But end as Member Pierce said, we need to remember that we're gonna make it through this together. And that's really a critical, critical element to it. And Diana's always been good at that. Let's do it together. I had one other thing. It, I got a note from the Minnesota Department of Health that we got a grant award, and maybe this went a long ways towards sending the Bloomington Public Health nine hundred and some thousand dollars tonight. But we got a grant from the, this was a, through the federal government, but it came through um, to our community health board nine hundred or seven hundred and fifty thousand four hundred and eighty-eight dollars. And I forgot to mention it the last time we met. And uh, it's a grant to the city of Edina, and um, really pleased to get that to help with all of the. COVID-related matters that Member Jackson alluded to. So uh, that's it for me. I hope everybody out there that's watching, whether or not you're watching, I guess, have a wonderful holiday season and uh, a prosperous new year. Let's, uh, let's stay positive. Let's keep moving forward. And, and let's, uh, let's do it the Adina way. Let's do it together. Thank you. Stay strong. Is there a motion to adjourn? Oh, excuse me, Manager Neal, anything? <laughs> that was it. Ah, I want to end right there. That's all right. <laughs> so so yeah. moved. All right, is there a motion to adjourn? Yes, motion to adjourn. <laughs> so, okay. All right, <laughs> motion second to adjourn. The City Council will be dying for the rest of the calendar year 2021. We'll see you all on January 4th, 2022. We stand adjourned.